Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I could um, call us to order, please, and we'll get started. Um, so, good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, University College Cork. Welcome also to those joining online. So, I hope that the online is up and um, running. Uh, you can also see that we have the sign language interpretation, and that will be, be ongoing. Um, I'm Professor Andrew Cotty from UCT. I'm one of the local organisers of today's event. Um, and in a moment, I'll hand over to UCC's president, Professor John O'Halloran, who's going to introduce um, the uh, Tornister. But to begin with, um, just a couple of uh, practicalities. Um, if people have any queries during the day, you can find staff from the Department of Foreign Affairs and from UCC who should be able to assist you. Uh, so for any queries, you can go to the uh, registration desk where you came in. Um, also, in the unlikely event of an emergency, um, you can please um, exit the lecture theatre by the doors uh, at the back, uh, and there are fire exits towards the back of the building, and you can also exit via the stairs uh, where you will have entered the, uh, the Boole uh, complex uh, as well. So without... Um, further ado, I'm very pleased to hand over to uh, President of University College Cork, uh, Professor John O'Halloran, who will formally welcome everyone to this event uh, and will introduce the Tornister. Please, President. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Good morning, everybody, and the warmest welcome to University College Cork to each and every one of you on this very special occasion. Tarnishta, elected representatives, members of the public, students and staff, international guests, and of course, if you're joining online, from the Boole University, um, University College Cork, you're very welcome to the first day of the government's consultative forum on international security policy. A particular welcome to Professor Louise Richardson. Uh, a great academic of this, of this country, and we're incredibly proud, Louise, of your academic credentials, but also your global leadership in higher education, and to have you here to chair the forum and welcome all those who are joining online. University College Cork is very pleased to host its first consultative forum. One of the roles of universities, of course, is to be places of thinking and public discourse and debate, a place of independent thinking, and it's appropriate that University College Cork are hosting this event here today. Foreign, security, and defence policy involve issues of relations with others, states, involvement of international organisation, of national identity, of war and peace, and use of military force. So by their very nature, such issues are sometimes contentious, producing debate and disagreement, sometimes heated disagreement. Universities are one of the places in society where we should have such discussions, where such discussions and conversations can be had in safety, with respect, but also with dialogue. Democracies are rooted in majority rule, but also free speech and is a respect for views and rights of others of minority opinions. As places for public dialogue, independent thinking, and creative research, universities are just a, a, have a particular place, but also, I would believe, a particular responsibility to enable these kinds of conversations to happen. And I'm sure that today and over the next few days of the forum, you will hear a diversity of views, there will be interesting discussions and sometimes disagreements, and all this should be welcomed. Public discussion of important national issues and central element of our democracy. We hope that UCC can play some part in this, in the, providing the opportunity today. Before introducing you to Tornish, I just want to, just on behalf of UCC, give enormous thanks to all the people that made this possible. This is a really important day for our institution, and events like this don't happen easily. I want to particularly thank the colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, who've made all of this possible. On the UCC side, our own team, Terrell Cullen, uh, who's our head of events, and I particularly worked hard to facilitate all that happened here today and will continue to happen. UCC security staff, KSG Catering, Professor Andrew Cotty, and the Department of, of Government and Politics, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Defence Forces for organising us here today. We are on a beautiful campus, uh, the world's first green flag campus. And when if you want to have a, get a break from it all, you might take a walk around it, and you will see biodiversity in action and habitat protection. And often then when we need to reflect in places and maybe reflect on opinions that we're trying to process ourselves, it's good to take the opportunity to do that. So I hope during the day, if you're taking a break, that you will take some time in, in our beautiful camp campus. It's now my pleasure to introduce Tornister, 
Our first speaker, uh, Michal Martin. Michal Martin, TD, is Tornishta, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Defence. The Tornishta has been the TD for Cork South Central since 1989 and Fianna Fáil party leader since 2011. He's previously served as Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, Minister for Health, Minister for Education and, of course, Taoiseach from 2020 to 2022. We're also incredibly proud that the Tornishta is an alumnus of this institution and a regular visitor here to UCC. So, Tornish, we're very pleased to welcome you back, and the floor is yours. Gamila Maugiv, thank you very much. Everybody. Colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, first of all, there's no point of order. I just want to go ahead and give my introductory speech, and we can have consultations later. But I want to thank President O'Halloran for the warm welcome to UCC, and I would like to thank the university, and in particular, Professor Andrew Cotty and his team for partnering with us in hosting this consultative forum. I can think of no better place Could I just say that I can think of no better place to open the proceedings of the forum than here in Cork and in University College Cork. And as an, as an, an academic centre of excellence, he <coughs> finished. Just say first of all that I grew up in this city and I learned about freedom of speech and democracy in this university and above all and above all Orkin, 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 please you had your platform you have said what you've had to say I would respectfully yeah I would have no Yeah. 
But I, but I also say, I think the most undemocratic thing you can do is try and shut down debate. And that's what you're trying to do here this morning. You are trying to shut down debate. You're behaving in a manner, you're behaving in a manner that's intolerant Corbyn, of the freedom of Corbyn, speech. Please. You don't want to allow other views to come forward. What you are saying is debate on your terms and on nobody else's terms. But that's not what we're going to do today. We're going to debate these issues. And I want to thank the majority of people who are here today who are, who are, and all of those who are following proceedings online and those who have made written submissions. Because this is the first time that our country has ever embarked on a national conversation of this kind and your willingness to engage is the parameter of its success. The forum aims to build a deeper political understanding and public understanding of the international security environment and Ireland's role in this complex world. I am confident that as a country we can have and we should have a respectful and informed debate from which we can all learn. I'm also very conscious that there are a variety of opinions in this country about the appropriate direction of foreign and security policy and it is important that all voices are heard. What we are embarking on for the next four days is not, as I said many times, a binary discussion on the issue of neutrality. What we have ahead of us over the next four days with 80 speakers with a wide range of experience, expertise and perspectives, discussing a variety of issues that make up our international security policy. And I see this debate as a logical continuation of the tone and the level of ambition that this government has set in exerting Ireland's influence abroad. In a statement earlier this week, I recalled our principled and successful membership of the UN Security Council in 2021 and 2022, and strong defence of multilateralism, our leadership at the European Union, including in ensuring a unified approach to Brexit, our Global Ireland strategy. The record levels of overseas development aid that we have provided focused on ending poverty and food insecurity, our commitment to double our international climate finance by 2025, and our consistent work in Northern Ireland in support of the Good Friday Agreement. As a country, we should be deeply proud of our record. We should be deeply proud of our peacekeepers, our diplomats and officials, our development workers who day after day advance Ireland's interests and values across the world. And we should be proud of the fact that we have become a confident and outward-looking country and people secure in our place in Europe and the world, and actively addressing the global challenges of conflict, hunger and climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the fundamental duty of every Irish government to put in place policies and practices to keep Ireland and our people safe and secure. Russia's, Russia's, brutal, Russia's brutal and illegal invasion of Ukraine blatantly violating the UN Charter and international law has fundamentally changed the geopolitical and security landscape in Europe. In its wake, countries all over Europe have examined and re-examined their foreign security and defence policies. And Ireland is no different. To shy away from doing so, or to do so behind closed doors, would be a fundamental mistake and an abrogation of responsibility. Nobody, nobody should fear a discussion of this kind. And no one should fear a thoughtful analysis or new ideas or hearing different perspectives and different viewpoints. Ireland's commitment to the United Nations Charter, to the rules-based multilateral order, is not in doubt. Ireland's policy of military neutrality, which has served us well for decades, will not be changed by this government. But none of this means that we should isolate ourselves or assume we have nothing to learn from or contribute to the wider debate about European security. Ireland's commitment 
to a values-based foreign policy, to multilateralism, and to a policy of military neutrality does not insulate us from the new reality we find ourselves in, and we must respond to that. In this, the 50th year of our European Union membership, it is more important than ever to recognize, understand, and discuss our place at the heart of Europe, including in relation to the European Union's common foreign and security policy. And that discussion should also include our work at the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is the world's largest regional security organization, as well as almost a quarter of a century, of course, of engagement with NATO under the Partnership for Peace program. We have always believed that the multilateral system with the United Nations Charter at its heart remains our strongest protection and our most important global security asset. As a neutral country, our security, indeed our very existence as a sovereign state, relies on the compliance by all nations, however large and powerful, with the rules-based international order. A little over a decade after Ireland joined the League of Nations, Eamon de Valera travelled to Geneva in 1935 and addressed the Assembly, memorably saying, and I quote, make no mistake, if on any pretext whatever we were to permit the sovereignty of even the weakest state amongst us to be unjustly taken away, the whole foundation of the League would crumble into dust. If the pledge of security is not universal, if it is not to apply to all impartially, if one aggressor is to be given a free hand while another is restrained, then it is far better that the old system of alliances should return and that each nation should do what it can to prepare for its own defence." De Valera was making these remarks as part of his government's determined effort to defend the integrity of the League of Nations just a short few years before the Second World War. As we turn to the reality of the world in 2023, we find ourselves living once again in extraordinary, violent and challenging times. Times in which we have once again witnessed the most blatant disregard for international law on our own home continent of Europe. Yesterday I attended the Ukraine recovery conference in London. I heard harrowing accounts of devastation and destruction in Ukraine from the Prime Minister of Ukraine, Denis Shemal. It was a sober reminder of the devastating human impact of war. Two years ago, it seemed unimaginable that there would be a large-scale land war in Europe, that we would see the largest displacement of people across the continent since the Second World War, that homes across Ireland would be opening their doors to receive almost 90,000 Ukrainians fle fleeing this appalling conflict. During our membership of the UN Security Council in 2022, we saw firsthand Russia abusing its position on the Council preventing the Council from acting or even speaking collectively in response to the invasion of Ukraine with its cynical use of the veto and spreading disinformation. Russia has also paralyzed European regional peace and security bodies, including the OSCE. Today, just as in the 1930s, the pledge of security that de Valera spoke of must be universal and apply equally and impartially to all. Might is not right. We cannot allow the more powerful or those with imperial ambitions to prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality of the new threat environment and global security was brought home to all of us in Ireland in 2021 with the ransomware attack on the health service executive. Hundreds of thousands of patients were affected and the cost of dealing with the fallout amounted to more than 10 million euro and this in the middle of COVID. Ireland's ge geography and military neutrality did not protect us from that attack, and it will not protect us from potential future attacks. And the simple fact is that Ireland's economic and international success, our vibrant indigenous and multinational business sector, our digital digitalized economy, and the global communications and energy infrastructure that runs through our waters make us uniquely vulnerable to new and emerging threats. Our discussions here take place less than 15 miles from Hall Boland, the main naval base and headquarters for the Irish Naval Service. Many of you will remember that just last year, Russia attempted to hold a naval exercise in our exclusive economic zone 
just weeks before their unprovoked and illegal war on Ukraine. Our own territorial waters and our wider exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, which is close to seven times our land area, is an area of critical and strategic importance for Ireland. Approximately three quarters of Ireland's natural gas is imported via pipelines. Ireland's EEZ is home to fibre optic cables that carry some 97% of global communications. And that is why this afternoon we will be discussing cyber security and maritime security and critical infrastructure. We need to fully understand the threat environment and develop systems to ensure that such ad infrastructure is adequately protected. Later sessions of the forum will also examine disinformation and the insidious nature of the deliberate ma manipulation of information. And this is an enormous challenge. The threat landscape that we face is complex. We, as an independent and sovereign nation, need to invest in the military and civilian expertise and capabilities required to adequately respond. The Independent Commission on the Defence Forces, which reported in February 2022, recommended significant changes for the Defence Forces and Defence provision in Ireland. Its recommendations covered Defence Forces structures, Defence capabilities, human resources, the Reserve Defence Force and funding, amongst other issues. On foot of these recommendations, as a government, we approved multi-annual funding increases to reach a defence budget of some 1.5 billion by 2028, index linked to inflation, and this will amount to a near 50% increase in defence funding by 2028. This single biggest investment in the history of the state shows a strong commitment on behalf of government to support our defence forces transition into a modern military force that is agile with the appropriate capability, culture and values that reflect the modern workplace and Irish society. There is an urgent need for cultural transformation in the Defence Forces, and this is being prioritised. A strategic governance framework has been established to drive the Commission's recommendations, and working with the new independent external oversight body that I have established, it will also be an important enabling mechanism for delivery of the independent review group's actions and recommendations, comprehensively dealing with the insidious issue of bullying and abuse within the Defence Forces. In short, my priority is to ensure that there is one strategic plan for the transformation of the Defence Forces, fully understood by everyone, that has the appropriate governance and reporting mechanisms and is properly resourced. In convening this national discussion, I wanted to ensure that our conversations about our security policy choices were well informed and based on fact and on evidence. Over the course of the four days, we will hear from close to 80 different panelists and moderators. These have been selected based on their practical experience or academic expertise, working in a wide variety of issues and areas. They include many Irish people who have, who have on the ground experience of peacekeeping, conflict prevention and resolution, and peace building in the United Nations, the European Union, the OSCE, and NATO-led missions in Chad, Afghanistan, Iraq, Ukraine, Georgia, Kosovo, Bosnia, Lebanon, and beyond. They include academics from all over the island of Ireland, as well as from Sweden, Finland, Norway, Switzerland, Poland, Denmark, and the United Kingdom, senior Irish officials, and civil society representatives. These individuals bring different perspectives, different lived experiences, different policy approaches, and I thank them wholeheartedly for being a part of this process. For all of you attending here in Cork and those planning to be in Galway and Dublin, your voice is important. But I don't just want the people in this room to consider these questions, or indeed for them to be limited to Cork, Dublin and, or Galway. I want these conversations to take place in kitchens and classrooms across the country, indeed given the weather today in parks and beaches too. We've already received hundreds of responses through the online consultation process, and I look forward to receiving many more. Before concluding, I would like to thank and to welcome to Cork the chair of the Consultative Forum, Professor Louise Richardson. Professor Richardson is an extraordinarily accomplished individual. She is president of Carnegie Corporation of New York and the former vice chancellor of the University of Oxford and former principal and vice chancellor of the University of St. Andrews. She is no stranger to today's university setting, 
having previously earned a PhD in international relations at Harvard University, where she spent 20 years on the faculty of the Department of Government teaching courses on international security and foreign policy. A native of Waterford, she's also familiar with the foreign and security policy challenges facing Ireland. She's an eminent and distinguished academic. Her expertise and experience will add significant value to this endeavor. And I'm very grateful to her for taking on this task as an independent chair. Louise, I wish you well in your role and in your work to capture the range of issues discussed and the key findings from the consultation process in your report. If we end these four days with more people in Ireland who are more informed and more confident that they have the factual information that they need to make up their own minds about an issue that affects all of us, the forum will have done its job well. Before, before handing over to our chair, I want to leave you with a few final thoughts. We all, if you would allow me just complete in, in a democratic fashion, <clears throat> we all come here today, we all come here today with different views, shaped by our own experience of the world. I, if you, with the greatest respect, Claire Daly and Mick Wallace have had their forum at the European Parliament. I'm entitled to have this forum here today to say a few brief introductory remarks. And if I could conclude, I think of my own, I think of my own family's history. My own father grew up close to Collins's barracks in this city. And I'm just saying, could I just simply say that I spoke about my own family system. My late father grew up in a working class district near Collins' barracks. His two older brothers went to join the British Army uh, and his younger brother followed after the war. My own father joined the Irish Army during what was termed here the emergency. Became a member of the Fianna Fáil party. His brothers who went to the British Army, one was imprisoned in Changi Prison during World War II. Uh, became a supporter and, uh, of the British Conservative Party all his life. His other brother, who was in the British Army at the time during the war, became a self-declared communist. And the third brother became a lifelong member of the British Labour Party. Now, the point being, life is complex, and you can anticipate or understand... <clears throat> Suffice to, suffice to say, when the family gathered, we had many interesting conversations and perspectives. So I think that has helped me to ground discussions and decisions in the human reality. Discussions on Ireland's international security policy may sometimes seem theoretical, but the implications of our choices are important. Important for the state and for the lived reality of each and every one of us that share this precious island. All of us need, together, to be the architects of our international security policy. And I look forward to honest, respectful, and informed conversations over the next four days. I know that I will learn a lot. I hope that all of you here and those following our discussions online will too. Louise, may I invite you now to take the floor. Shame on British imperialism for carrying out genocide upon genocide against our country. 
And now you have I'd like to welcome you all today, to and especially those of you who are listening online. To proclaim that you will I would like to make a few substantive remarks before describing us, how the forum the is going to work. And I do hope the gentlemen in the audience will allow the forum to work, because I think millions, quite a few people would like an opportunity beings. to express their Over point of view. Over a million children have died in these wars mm. in the Middle East that your friends mm. have sponsored. This is a That's matter it. of life and death for people, not a matter of intellectualising with pseudo-qualifications and nonsense. The working people of Ireland are not for war. I was delighted to have been asked to chair this forum. In my 40 years plus studying and thinking about international relations and international security, I have the principle of this great university and all the universities in this country is freedom of speech. It's permitting others to express their point of view. So notwithstanding the last few minutes, I... I'd like to make a few substantive remarks before explaining how the forum is going to run. Notwithstanding the last few moments, I should say that I've been delighted to, uh, to be asked to chair the forum. In my, in my 40 years studying and thinking about international relations and international security, I've never come across a government that was willing to launch a public discussion about a country's role in the world. Usually, matters of international security are confined to a small group of officials and decision makers. I thought then, and think now, that the idea of having an open conversation was innovative, creative, and wise. This is actually participatory democracy with all its strengths and weaknesses in action, and I'm delighted to be a part of it. The, the geopolitical landscape has charged, changed radically in the past 35 years. I'm sorry we are not allowing disruptions of speeches. I have the floor at the moment. The discussion will be happening as part of the panels. Right now we're having opening remarks. The geopolitical landscape has changed radically in the past 35 years. The heady days of optimism that marked the end of the Cold War, the days that Francis Fukuyama labeled the end of history, they did not herald a new era of peace. Instead, we witnessed the fragmentation and disintegration of the states of Eastern Europe, the murderous attacks of 9-11 and their very bloody aftermath, the deterioration of relations between the two largest economies in the world, and in February last, the brutal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the brutality of Russian attacks on civilian targets has shocked us all. With scenes from Bakhmut being reminiscent of Verdun, not 21st century warfare. So the world has changed, and where does this leave us? Most of the major problems confronting the world today, climate change, disease, migration, terrorism, they transcend national borders and require international cooperation if they are to be effectively countered. For a long time, Ireland's geographic location on the edge of Europe protected us. In the early years of independence, we looked inward. The economy stagnated and the population declined. With the Whitaker reforms of the late 50s, and most emphatically with the decision to join the European communities in the 70s, our economy took off. Today, we are one of the most globalized economies in the world. Our population too, notwithstanding our size and location, has, a, has long had a global outlook. I attribute this to two factors, though no doubt there are others. And the first, as alluded to by the Tornishta, is the impact on Irish families of immigration. Just about every family in the country has sent children overseas to be part of the great Irish diaspora 
And that has, co has caused us to feel a deep connection to the countries in which our relations live. And secondly, and especially for people of, of my generation, is the role of the Catholic Church in sending missionaries overseas, which led us to have a sense of the world and a much less privileged world beyond our shores. So the question before us now is, what is the role of a small, wealthy country, a small, wealthy, globalized country in this world? Now, it's often thought that Darwin said that it's the fittest who survive, but actually, Darwin's argument was that it's the most adaptable that survive and thrive. So the question for us is, how are we going to adapt to these changes in the geopolitical environment? That is the question before us over the next several days. So let us examine our assumptions about our place in the world and decide how we wish to adapt. As we grapple with complex questions and nuanced arguments, I hope that we can do so in a spirit of what my colleague Timothy Garton Ash has called robust civility. Let us try to change one another's mind, but critically, let us be open to having our own minds changed too. And at all times, I hope that we can uh, adopt or adhere to the Augustinian precept, audi alterum partum, listen to the other side. We have a packed agenda over the next four days. My role as chair is to facilitate the discussion, to ensure that as many voices as possible are heard, and to keep to time. Uh, those in attendance will have received a copy of the guiding principles, and I hope everyone will consult them. These are the principles that we trust will guide our discussions over the next few days. The format will be a series of panel discussions, and about half the time assigned to each panel will be devoted to a discussion between the moderator and the panelists, and the other half to discussion with participants, uh, both those online and uh, on the floor. Um, I trust you've seen Slido. We will be taking uh, contributions, questions, and comments through Slido. You'll also be able to endorse the comments or questions of others. Uh, you can download the free app, uh, or you can sign up to uh, www.slido.com. Um, in the interest of hearing as many voices as possible and in keeping with the principle of this university and all great universities that one permits, encourages, and um, fosters debate rather than shut it down, we will endeavor to keep, or I would plead with you to keep all questions or comments as briefly as possible, ideally less than two minutes. Again, this is not to constrain anyone's freedom of expression, but only to ensure that as many people as possible can be heard. Um, the sessions will start and end on time. Uh, and so if you're out having coffee, I'm afraid you will miss the beginning of sessions because we are going to keep to time. Um, the panel sessions will be live streamed on the website. Recordings will be available. And uh, I hope you will be able to engage with them, take the time to read them. And they will also help you if you decide you'd like to respond to the consultation, which I hope you will do. Uh, those of you who came this morning have a notebook on the back of which is a QR code which takes you, if you scan it, to the, to the website. Uh, so with that, let's make this a memorable, productive, and above all, illuminating several days. And with that, like, I'd like to invite the panelists for the first session to join me here on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So our first session, we're starting at the most general level, which is the, the geopolitical environment, to which both the Thornister and I alluded a few moments ago. And to help us explore this issue, we have four panelists. Renata Dawn, who is Senior Consulting Fellow at Chatham House. Professor Bridget Laffin, who is Emeritus Professor of the European University Institute. Neil Melvin, Neil Melvin sorry, is Director of International Security at RUSI. And Roshane Nikalaher, Head of International advocacy at concern. So thank you all for joining us. So let us perhaps start at the most general level, which is that we have, this is a country which, um, whose prosperity and security has thrived on participating in um, a global environment 
controlled by international law, and yet international law has taken um, some hammering recently. How does this change the, um, the environment in which we face? I'm going to ask Neil to start with this, as, as you are the one, you have focused, your work is focused, I think, on the implications particularly of Ukraine. So if you mm. would get us started on this, please. No, th thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to join this very important discussion. And I was struck by the foreign minister's comments, actually, uh, noting that he just returned from the Ukraine Reconstruction Conference, and he spoke eloquently about, I think, the reality, which is Europe is at war. I mean, uh, as we speak, uh, tens, if not hundreds, of, of men, civilians, are being killed every day in Ukraine. Some of the largest combat since World War II is happening. So we, we're facing a massive crisis. This, this, is a, this is a war that is transforming European security. But I uh, am struck also by the fact that it's part of, I think, a much broader shift that is happening at the global level. We're facing a, uh, a shift in power balances, and that is really a key question because much of the order that we are know and familiar with and rely on for, for many of the rules and the peace and security uh, set in place after World War II, but also in the early 1990s after the collapse of communism. These are the systems that are facing the biggest challenges today. And uh, we also see, I think, these battles being fought out uh, for influence uh, within the, the UN system. And so this, this, to me, is a moment when uh, the Euro-Atlantic community in particular needs to look at how it's going to navigate uh, these challenges. And while the rules-based order is clearly uh, vital, um, the war, I think, in Ukraine, the rising challenge from Russia, China, but also others. I mean, we see with the Iran on, on the verge of possibly having nuclear weapons, other regional actors seeing this as a moment when they can perhaps assert themselves in, in their neighborhood. Uh, ideas of defense and deterrence have reemerged as actually being the basis for building stability, strategic stability, peace and order. And so this, I think, alongside trying to defend the rules-based order is, is increasingly important. So, and so the discussion that we're looking to in terms of the NATO Vilnius summit about how to secure Ukraine in the future, uh, Ukraine is going to need det det uh, deterrence and defense commitments from the wider European community because the Russia threat is not going to go away. So this, I think, is uh, a challenge that is a very, it's a generational challenge, if you like, because it's not just about Europe. And, and, and my, perhaps my last point is that European security has become international security. The Ukraine war is not just about the European concerns. Uh, it's also about needing to engage with countries in Asia and Africa. Uh, it's about uh, needing to uh, have Japan and South Korea for sanctions. Uh, it's about building new relationships with Australia. So security is changing, and we need to be, uh, as, as I think you rightly said, adaptable in this environment without giving up on our principles. Thank you. Bridget, can we pick up on that point that Neil just made, European security is international security? Yes, I, I think that's a really important point because uh, this war in Ukraine, a power has invaded another country and broken one of the fundamental norms of a rule-based order. In other words, the territorial integrity of a country. Not only that, but the conduct of the war. There are war crimes being committed on our continent on a daily basis but also then the consequence of that for the rest of the world because Ukraine was a breadbasket and the fact that it's so difficult to export uh, grain from Ukraine now, how problematic it is, has driven up food inflation and is very, uh, is, is very problematic for the poorest in the world. So it's not just that we have food inflation in Ireland, but there is food inflation is a huge problem uh, in the world. I think also, and I, I agree that there is, it's, it's the context of deep structural changes. And what we see, and it's not good for our world, is a danger of rival blocks, a more fragmented world and rival blocks, because what one sees is links between Russia, China and Iran. And then what does that mean? It would be very bad for the world and for the West if it ends up as being the West versus the rest. I also think with these deep structural changes, you see the emergence of what might be called the middle powers, India, Brazil. So in other words, we live in a more fragmented world, but we also live in a world with shifting power balances. And as one order 
changes. It's un you can see some of the faint outlines of a new order emerging, but we don't have an order in our world today. And I also think the rules-based order is being contested within the United Nations. It's being contested uh, at every level. But bringing it all back down to, to this country, Geography has been benign for us for most of our history as an independent state. I think that's ended. Why has it ended? It's ended because technology is a driver of, of security now and threat, cyber, but also with the, with the, with the uh, changes in the high Arctic, uh, in fact, Ireland, the Irish waters become very close to, 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 to areas where you can have the Russian Navy, as, as the Thonish just said. And so, for example, should Ireland be a member of the Arctic Council? So these are the kinds of things. So our geographical position hasn't changed, but the meaning of our geography has changed in the new world. So I think we need to scan the global, the regional, and then also our geography and our relationship in our neighborhood. And let me end by saying, Ireland's geoeconomic and geostrategic anchor in the world, and the only one we have, is EU membership. And to think that there are alternatives there for us, there aren't. So I think we need also to be realistic about our geography, our geostrategic anchors, and what that means for our place in the world and for how we conduct ourselves. Thank you very much, Bridget. Renata, you've spent 15 years, I think, with the United Nations. This must resonate. <coughs> what you're hearing must resonate with you, what do you think? Yeah, I think from, uh, from the perspective of the UN, where i am just come from, I would underscore that while European security is international security, so too African security exactly. is international security. So too, stability in where I live now, uh, Asia, uh, impacts Ireland and the world. And even as you think about a European and Euro-centred security, which you need to in Ireland, it's critical to also think about a global security. It's not an either or. It's a needing to see both. And I'll just add to your thoughts a couple of points. First, this fragmentation that we're seeing, it's not new. And I think it's really important that the security debate in Ireland and the debate about what Ireland's security posture should be doesn't start from Ukraine. While Ukraine is critical and is the single biggest conflict on, uh, in the territory of Europe since World War II, and as it led to the single biggest refugee crisis on the territory, and I'm not talking about globally, but I'm talking about on the territory of uh, Europe, it is, we're seeing it reveal fractures that were already there. Fractures that are there since uh, the perception of Russia feeling left out of the world. The rise of China, which we haven't mentioned yet, but is a critical determinant for the future order of how US and China navigate their world. And a perception on much of the world that they have been left out of a global financial uh, world, a global economic world, a globalized trade and economic world that's been good for Ireland, but not necessarily good for other parts of the world. So when we think about those security threats, I think we need to have a, maintain that global order. And I would just flag one thing. Ireland is often forgotten that Ireland is Europe's number two trading partner with China, next to, next to the Germany. So if Ireland wants to think about its security policy, it needs to think about its trading partners. If Ireland thinks about its role as a data center, and one of the most significant increasingly data centers uh, outside the United States, it needs to think about itself in terms of a global data partner and what does the cyber security world look like, but also its role in shaping that uh, engagement. And if Ireland thinks about the source of much of its wealth, which is managing an, an economy in which most of the large US tech companies are based in Europe, we need to think about how that shapes ourselves, both as target as well as what we can bring to the world. So I think it's important that we don't start from Ukraine as a ground zero and that we don't limit it to a narrow security debate, but it looks larger. Thank you. 
Now, Rochelle, you've, t you've been working on this from a humanitarian perspective with concern. How do you see the points that have been raised? So picking up from what uh, Renat was saying, taking a broader lens on this, I think we can agree that we're in a very interconnected but deeply unequal world. Um, and if we take one step back and remember the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic and the, the poorest were, were so badly affected by that, it pushed 77 million people, more people into extreme poverty. Um, Mike Ryan described it, Mike Ryan from the WHO described it recently as a triumph of science and a failure in equity. And that failure of equity uh, is visible across all our engagement looking at humanitarian contexts. Conflict is um, the main driver of humanitarian need, and 25% of the world currently is living in conflict-affected contexts. So I know there'll be other panels that will take up some of these issues later in the, in the, in the uh, discussions, but there's 108 million people displaced, and you mentioned adaptability in your opening remarks. There's no one more adaptable than a refugee, so that one in every 74 people in the world is displaced. Um, and I think in relation to international law, when we talk about international law, we must talk about international humanitarian law and how that is such an essential part of our work as humanitarians. It's also about keeping civilians safe uh, and allowing us to reach civilians with humanitarian assistance and state and non-state actors have an essential responsibility in that. So I'm really hopeful that this conversation picks up on those issues during the week. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Floor that we should address before we go any further. Uh, can the panellists please define what they mean by the rules-based order? Why not refer to the UN Charter and international law? Neil, I think you were the first person. Yeah. Thanks. That's a, that's a tough, a very good question. I mean, as an expert, I would say to, to me there is, uh, in a way, three parts to the rules-based order. There is the United Nations security system, uh, you know, the agreement of the post-World War II, and uh, the, the principles uh, and values uh, from the UN, its institutions, the Security Council, uh, and how that then is, is set up in, in a set of regional security organizations that, that sort of pivot around that. The second one is, is the economic system. I mean, the, the Bretton Woods uh, system, uh, which again, it, we, see, we see challenged. But then there's a third element, which is the more complex one in a way, which is the United States at the center of this order and a set of often bilateral or minilateral arrangements that underpin the first two to a large degree. And so we see that, I mean, I think this is why it, this is a moment of flux because not only is it the institutions and the principles that are being challenged, but it is also the, the role of the United States and the set of relationships, the geopolitical relationships that it uh, underpins uh, normally around that, and, it, and it's an enforcer. I mean, we see that in the terms of how the United States is, uh, together with other allies and partners, seeks to uphold uh, the freedom of uh, movement on the, on the high seas, for example, in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Strait, elsewhere in the world. So this interlocking set of issues is at the core, uh, and you can't really, in a way, simply uh, devolve ge geopolitics from the order itself, I would argue. Thank you. Bridget, do you want to... I, I think it's a really important question, and for small states in particular, the more international law that exists, the more international uh, multilateral institutions that exist and that function well, the safer for small states. Small states rely more on multilateralism than those with power. But there's no world order will ever exist without power. There will always be, it may contain power, it may structure power, but we will never, ever, ever get away from the fact that there will be stronger and weaker states, larger and smaller states in international politics. But the more there's a scaffolding around power, the better for small states. So there's a real value, but not just obviously for small states, but it, it's good for every country to have as much predictability and as strong a normative frame as possible in international politics. But we'd be naive to think that the world that power does, isn't also a core driver of international politics. And we see in the China-America relationship now, it's great power competition. I think one of the uh, reasons why this rules-based order is being so contested is that there's a perception 
that it reflects one part of the world. And that is undoubtedly, as you uh, flagged, Neil, a US origin world. I would say it goes back to a 19th century European order. And a large part of the reason it's been contested is from sets of countries that are outside that order saying, well, hang on a minute, your order, should I just take it on willy-nilly? Do I need to take on your views of gender? Do I need to take on your views of fairness? Do I need to take on your views of justice? How that works for you, death penalty issues? And the question, it seems to me, where does Ireland stand in that? You talk about a values-based security policy. You're a proud upholder of many of those values, human rights, gender equality, perceptions of fairness, anti-death penalty. So how do you navigate then a world in which those are being contested? And how do you both protect and uphold that order while recognizing the legitimacy of other voices saying we want to think that order again? An example of that happening right now is the, the initiative being led by the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, about changing the international financial institutions, about reflecting fairness and equity in representation and debt management and thinking. Where does Ireland stand on an issue like that? Would you like to mention? Yes, I think and, um, if you look at how conflicts play out and the number of protracted conflicts that there are around the world and the lack of hope there is in how those conflicts are going to be resolved, I think that is a big question in relation to how, how the world works. The, the role of the UN Security Council, obviously, and the, 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 the focus of the Council in discussing conflicts but not necessarily resolving conflicts. And the other key part of that I think is how do we prevent conflict from happening in the first place and that I think is something that is often neglected in conversations is the prevention of conflict has to be essential. So the question for us then is yeah there's a number of themes here inequality connectedness and uh, the role of the EU but how do we as a, a very small country prevent conflict from taking place? I don't have the answer to that question um, I think I have uh, a perspective on how Irish NGOs and how Ireland engages in conflict contexts. And there is a perspective, and I think it would be shared by many, that a country that has experienced our own famine, our own conflict, um, has a particular understanding and perhaps a particular empathy with countries. I think what we bring to that is a balanced approach our emphasis on both humanitarian and development engagement but also the capacity to listen um, and as a, um, a small a relatively small actor that we have a good opportunity to have those kinds of conversations that other countries perhaps wouldn't be able to have i think we saw that during um, ireland's role on the un security council in the last two years that uh, I'm not comfortable with the term honest broker, but there's certainly value in a country like Ireland being able to have these kinds of conversations and push issues like conflict and hunger that other countries don't feel is, a, is as important in the greater scheme of things, but it is absolutely essential. Well, there's a question that has come in from Ben Smith here, which is on this theme, saying, um, does our non-aligned militar militarily not uniquely position us to bring divided sides to the table? and create the compromise that is central to diplomacy. Do you think that's true? I mean, I'll take a go at that one, <laughs> having worked in the UN for a long time, where the question of how Ireland is perceived. Without a doubt, the lack of a military partnership and the perception of military uh, neutrality has an important role in, in this. And I would say also small st states now increasingly, to, to note Bridget's points, are often being seen as the bridge builders across different groups and different entities. And there's a, there's a desire to find those, the Namibias of this world, uh, the, the Costa Ricas of this world, countries that can sort of be seen to, to work across the different groupings. Uh, but I don't think anyone thinks Ireland is non-aligned or neutral. Ireland is a member of the EU. Ireland stands on human rights issues. And Ireland, some of Ireland's most contentious debates during its Security Council presidency was against countries from the so-called developing world. I say that, you know, in apostrophes. It's not a term they like, but nor do they like the Global South. And so issues around human rights and values and protection of civilians with Ethiopia. Um, issues today in Mali, where there's a UN peacekeeping force being ejected by a coup regime 
because of it having a human rights component and an objection to its human rights component. So the world is a more complex one. So if you want to be reflecting values in your foreign and security policy, uh, the assumption that somehow that isn't going to lead you to be aligned, I think you have to be very honest about that. And can, can I also say, and I, I hesitate given that academics have taken a bashing this morning uh, in saying what I'm about to say, but I think there should be some serious research done here on looking at Ireland in, in comparison to other small states, our UN voting record, our various, in various different spheres, to, to unravel, is Irish foreign policy the way it is because we are small or neutral or both. And I think that I remember doing work in this, and I'm unfortunately in the 1980s, and I'm too old to do it again, <clears throat> but our profile was very much that. We were very close to the Dutch, we were very close to the Danes, we were close to the Finns. So our pro we were close to countries that were in NATO and countries that were not in NATO. And my overwhelming take from that work back then was our foreign policy profile was largely small with the with the historical context that gives Ireland a certain distinctiveness. So I, I, I plead uh, in the interest of if there are any young uh, Cork researchers out there and you need a good topic for your master's programme, take a look at that. Neil. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I won't comment on Ireland, but, but I, I follow Northern Europe uh, rather closely. Uh, and of course, what we see there is... Uh, a dramatic shift. I mean, uh, small countries, medium small countries that I think may have followed a, a similar line in some ways to Ireland. I mean, they, they invested very heavily in the multilateral order uh, and they remain committed to that. They're very much focused on preserving values, fighting for human rights, advancing democratization. But at the same time, there's been a realization that the world has changed and that they need to adapt and change with that. So we've seen, of course, the Finnish and uh, Swedish application to join NATO. But even more deeply than that, a shift in the way that they understand foreign and security policy and the way that development assistance uh, is approached, the, uh, the understanding of, of what Renata said about the importance of their relations to China, that, that the economy is also part of security, that you have, that you're vulnerable around critical national infrastructure. So I think that there is a shift going on more broadly across Europe. I also live in Geneva, and even in, in Switzerland, we see a, a kind of a big discussion about what, what neutrality means and a sense that the past model may not, while they may want to, to maintain key aspects of that, it has to be adapted to the new reality that is emerging. And in order to actually sort of uh, keep playing a role, you maybe have to change a little bit, or, or perhaps maybe more fundamentally, and, and certainly in Northern Europe, the assessment is that there is uh, not just the war in Ukraine, but a long-term vulnerability to Russia, that actually the war in Ukraine is likely to see a Russia, even if Russia is defeated, a Russia that will remain a major threat to them, uh, that may even become a more dangerous actor, and uh, in a rather frightening way, a country that may rely more on its nuclear forces, which are located in Northern Europe and feel more vulnerable. And so the whole maritime space, which extends beyond uh, the north into the Atlantic becomes a really key security environment for the whole of European security, including that actually this very difficult issue of the, of the nuclear forces in Russia. Thank you. We have, um, we have questions pouring in here, and one that follows on this theme is, um, uh, what role does Ireland have to play in the development of the EU Defence Force as enshrined in the new strategic compass document. I should say, I think we have a range of different people following this, um, a range of in, um, expertise amongst the people following uh, this discussion. So um, I would encourage people to spell out acronyms and, and not, uh, minimize use of jargon. But in any event, what do you think? What role? Anyone want to take so that? So let, let, let me begin. Uh, so Ireland is an EU member state. Under Article 2 of the treaties, we have to uh, show loyal cooperation with the system and with our partners. Uh, we have certain carve-outs from uh, existing uh, in terms of the, the, uh, what, uh, the outcome of both Nice and, and Lisbon. So it will be up to this country to decide, in my view. So let's take something like PESCO, uh, which is cooperation on, on security and defence. 
Now, we've joined a, a number of different PESCO projects, and yet, in public opinion, sometimes PESCO bad. So let me just say what the projects we're involved in are. One is to do with uh, training uh, medics for, for, for conflict zones. The other is to do with cyber security. There's another one on surveillance, uh, maritime surveillance. Now, I don't think there's any Irish person should oppose our involvement in things that give protection to our armed forces, increase their capabilities, and allow us to have a, an armed forces fit for purpose for the 21st century. Whether or not, and we did sign up to battle groups way back, but in fact the battle groups ended up as being paper tigers. So I do think there'll be a question in future uh, as to what Ireland will do if the EU develops in terms of a, a more hard security. The big question for the e facing the EU and security is, it, there will be more security concerns in the EU and there will be a development of, 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 of security within the EU. But one of the things that the war in Ukraine has emphasised beyond anything else is that when it comes to the security of Europe, NATO is the only game in town. And as long as a US commitment to the defence of Europe remains, then I think the EU will develop but it'll be much more the softer side of security rather than hard. But I do think that we should be open about what, uh, open uh, about uh, the future, and we should do whatever we think is in the interests of strengthening the capability of this country, uh, because as we know, our military capability uh, is weak. And then I think the only big potential game changer in terms of security in Europe is if the United States ever reduces its commitment to the security of Europe, then I think that's a big, big shock to the European system and Ireland won't be, won't be able to escape it. But at the moment, I think we should be very open. And again, I would say very important to be transparent about all of the PESCO stuff. Just put it out there on the public record as it is what we're involved in, what the rationale is, because I think very few people would oppose Ireland being involved in things that are good for our armed forces. Thank you. I'll just add maybe to that, uh, although Bridge is the EU, the EU expert, I would say um, just to echo her point that the war in Ukraine has reinforced the centrality of the United States for Europe's defense and the reinforced the centrality of NATO as the primary vehicle for uh, Euro-Atlantic security. And to that extent, Ireland has some thinking to do about what sort of relationship it wants to have with NATO, what sort of relationship uh, EU and NATO have, and how does it contribute to that discussion. I wouldn't underestimate the debates in the United States about the sustainability of US engagement, uh, we are going into a really difficult uh, general election or presidential election in the United States. And so I don't think it's entirely sure that the questions about how much the US should do in Europe, how much is it willing to pay, are over. And I think we're into a prolonged period of questioning about that. What I would say is that one consequence of the war in Ukraine has been to turn not just NATO inward, away from thinking about crisis management outside, and the European Union, but much more focus on um, collective defence inward. And that is going to raise a real question for what is the role of European contributions to crises outside Europe and to crises, whether they're climate-driven crises, whether conflict-driven crises, humanitarian crises, what is that role going to be at a time when all the institutions of Europe are very much looking inward on the territory? Thank you. Renata, would you like to comment on that? Because surely one of the many tragedies of Ukraine is the distraction of resources away from countries like Africa, uh, by countries like Britain in furtherance of, of Ukraine. It's, I, I don't like to look at it as a drawing resources away from other places. I think it's a, it's a good example of where we're headed in terms of international armed conflict and the, the impact when, it's, when, the, when there is a pro proximity issue issue but 
I think the, 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 the bigger concern around it is not just the, the attention that's going to um, uh, the Ukraine, but also the humanitarian resources that are not going to other places. Um, and, the, and, and we're not paying enough attention to the impact that that is having. I think the other point to bring up, and it's interesting when we talk about Ireland as a small island, we often don't see that from a climate perspective. And I think, as you're saying, in terms of climate change, climate is a security issue. And I think that's also one of the really important things that we have to bring up here is how, how, we, um, how we view climate, how we also look at what that's doing to food, uh, food production, but what it's also doing to communities who are moving and have nowhere else, nowhere else to go. And that security lens, I think, is really essential. Also. Thank you. Um, well, quite a number of people have endorsed this question, so I, I'd like to pose it to the panel, um, though it's a fairly specific one. The absence of a national security strategy arguably hampered the Commission on the Defence Forces in its threat analysis. Can this process contribute to NSS development? Who would like to take that? <laughs> so I, I, I don't think Ireland has a strong security culture. Uh, we don't have a, a history of uh, a security strategy and discussions on security. Uh, we tend to talk in very abstract terms about security, and I think that's because the main security threat to the state historically has been internal rather than external. Uh, and I think we need to develop that because if, the, if we're going to invest more in our armed forces, as I think we should, then we should know why and if we're going to purchase military equipment or kit, uh, then for what security purpose? So I do think we need to develop uh, a security culture in this country. I think there's another feature of Ireland that, that is regrettable, and that is that we have a very professional armed forces. The officer corps is extremely well trained, but there's a tendency to almost contain them in the barracks. What do I mean by that? That you don't hear voices of experienced military personnel, which you hear in other countries. Uh, and they've so much to bring. They know what it's about. And I really think it's very valuable. And I think it's also very good that we now have in the Iraq, there's some people who were you know, former members of the armed forces. But I think we need to, be, to loosen out and uh, have more discussion and debate rather than, I mean, again, there's a tendency in Ireland, as you know, we heard this morning, somehow or other NATO is evil uh, incarnate. But if you're sitting in Warsaw today, or if you're in Latvia, Lithuania, or uh, Estonia, then you really value your country's membership of NATO. Well, because the, the only thing the difference between Poland today and Ukraine is Poland is a member of NATO. And so the point I'd like to make is that we must be respectful in this country, given our relatively benign geographical position, we must be respectful of the geographical exposure of our neighbours. And we must understand that they come from a very different perspective. And as you said, in Northern Europe, it has changed. And it has changed... The, 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 the Finns decided to join NATO because they think they need to. They aren't doing it to wage war. They're doing it for their security to avoid war. Renate? I would just say that I think a national security strategy is a way of enabling a transparent consideration of security threats facing uh, any country. And therefore, it's, I think, incumbent on a democratic country to have some fort, sort of an expression of a strategy on security. Otherwise, it's not transparent and it's sitting in some institutional bureaucrats and you don't know where it is. The second aspect I would say is, I think we're all describing unpredictability, whether that's because of climate, whether that's because of wars, because that's of non-state threats. And when you think about unpredictability and how to respond, you need to look and consider coolly and rationally the range of threats you face. A national security strategy allows you to articulate the range of threats. You have to consider priorities across them, 
but at least it allows you to list and consider the sorts of threats that a country like Ireland might face. So I would say for democratic reasons, as much as for navigating the unpredictability of the security threat, where you don't know if it's a, a group attacking your cyber, your critical infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, if it's a submarine under your water, if it's a, a migration crisis, if it's a climate crisis. That's the range of threats you might be looking at. At least articulating those will help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can just add. I mean, from the UK has we've had two national security strategies in this, in the face of a few years, the, the 2021 uh, strategy, and then we've just done a refresh, uh, and that I think uh, highlights also the sense that not only do you need one, but things are changing fast. So it, it is a very important point to have a national discussion about your priorities, but also about the resources uh, that you want to put into that. And I would. I would just if they say, if you look across Europe now, uh, and going back to the previous point, is that Europe, European nations are stepping up on national security and defence. They're increasing their defence spending, they're increasing capabilities. Germany just released its first uh, ever national security strategy, so uh, moving from a, a position that was, uh, to some degree, relatively pacifist, although a member of NATO, it, there's been the Zeitenwender, the famous sort of turn that was announced by, by um, Chancellor Schulz. And the national security strategy is seen, I think, as a key document to allow the country to have that kind of discussion, particularly in a coalition, and bring everyone together on what the, what the consensus is. And this is because, uh, again, going back to the previous point, Europe is going to have to step up in terms of its defence and security. I mean, all the countries across Europe are looking at what they're doing. Uh, it's partly about the, this US question, is that, is that if you want the US to remain engaged uh, on European security, Europe needs to increase uh, its commitments. If the US is going to disengage or, or move its resources elsewhere, because Europe, the US is looking at the China threat, the Indo-Pacific is seen as its key national interest, Europe is going to have to cover those issues. But then, as Renata said, there are many other security issues that, unfortunately, at the moment are going unaddressed. The, the whole Sahel uh, is in a very bad state. Sort of people, uh, countries that are descending into violence, and large numbers of civilians being killed, the migrants coming to Europe. So this is a natural area for Europe and perhaps the EU uh, to look at how to do crisis management. But it's going to need resources and the commitment of, of European countries. And so. All of this, I think, is it's the right moment for European nations to look at these questions and come to some kind of consensus about how is the best way to address this changed environment. Thank you. Well, we have a large number of questions coming in, and you can see them, and some of them I'd very much like to get to. But we also have some people here who might want to participate. And in particular, we have members of the Oireachtas uh, Joint Committee on Foreign and Defence Policy. So if they would like to speak, uh, I'd be happy to recognise them, sir. I'm Matt Carty, Sinn Féin spokesperson on foreign affairs and defence and a member of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Foreign Affairs and, and, and Defence. I think it's crucially important that the starting point of all of these conversations is that Ireland's legacy in terms of neutrality and having an independent foreign policy has served us incredibly well. I think it's something that we should be very proud of. And I think that, as I say, should be the starting point as we move forward. We need to recognise, of course, that there are challenges and there are things that we need to address, not least of, um, of which is the fact that we don't have a defence forces that's fit for purpose. We have very capable and very honourable members of the defence forces who have been doing their best under very difficult um, circumstances. But over the past number of decades, they have been starved of the resources that are required in order for them to do an effective job. When the Taunish, uh, he referenced two points in respect of, you know, uh, um, examples of the changing world. He mentioned the cyber attack in relation to the HSE, and he mentioned the fact that the, um, there was Russian vessels in our waters. In both instances, 
part of the responsibility obviously lay with others, but the responsibility for the failures lay in the fact that Ireland hadn't invested in the defence mechanisms that would be required to address those, both in terms of um, cyber security in the first instance, something that has been addressed, but also in respect of the fact that um, our, our, our Navy wasn't in a position to actually monitor and isn't in a position to monitor what's happening in our skies and seas. Um, and that is something that we need to address. But as we move forward, I think um, there is a there is a notion, I, I fear, that there is an, an inevitability that the world is, is moving towards greater conflict, um, greater um, um, instability, uh, um, and, and, gra and, and greater disengagement. Um, and the question should be asked, who is best placed across the world to actually play a role in actually preventing those things from happening? And I think Ireland through our unique history of being a uh, former um, colonized as opposed to colonizer, which is relatively unique in Western European te terms. Um, our role is having a very long-standing military neutrality and also having an independent foreign policy and the role of organizations such as Concern and our NGOs and um, our, um, our very strong track record in comparison to others in relation to overseas development aid. All of those things should combine for us to have a foreign policy that is actually about ending conflict as opposed to participating in it. And I think that that has to be central to the discussions as we move forward because military neutrality, independent foreign policies should not be framed as weaknesses on the part of Ireland. They should be seen as strengths that we should all be very proud of. Thank you very much. So I think what I'm going to do, given the number of people on the floor who would like to participate, I'm going to alternate between <coughs> questions on Slido and questions from the floor. And in Slido, I'll just go with the ones that have most uh, support for the question. Hope that's acceptable to everyone. So, um, should, and some of these are quite specific. Should Ireland strengthen its many lateral security relations, for instance, in partnering closer with Portugal, Spain, and France as an alternative to big defense pacts? Anyone? That's a question for you, really, I think, Neil. Yeah, well, I mean, I can, what is happening across Europe, um, so I'm, I'm following it as an analyst, is that uh, the Ukraine war and the growing security challenges, we're seeing uh, a consolidation and a greater unity in general in the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, as we've already highlighted here, I think uh, a new emphasis on NATO as the collective security basis for Europe, but also for the EU for doing many of these issues around resilience, uh, economic security, uh, defence industrial strategy. But alongside that, there is a very active minilateral process underway in which countries are looking to their neighbours. In particular, we see that in Northern Europe and uh, uh, Central Europe, France uh, and Spain. Uh, the UK is, is doing minilateralism. So there's a kind of thickening of European security, both in these multilateral formats and these minilateral formats. And the advantage of minilateral formats is that often it means that you're working with countries who I think understand you uh, quite closely. And so you can move very quickly. You can identify common issues. Uh, and sometimes uh, is that they can actually fill gaps that the multilateral framework struggles with. So uh, one example is the UK has a, a mechanism with uh, many of its European neighbours called the Joint Expeditionary Force, which sits just below NATO. So that, uh, and their concern there is that if Russia, for example, engages in hybrid activities, cyber attacks, by the time that you'd got to an Article 5 situation and reached consensus, a lot of damage could be done. But actually, these minilateral can step in and maybe address that. Uh, critical national infrastructure, we're also seeing, particularly underwater infrastructure, we're seeing minilaterals uh, emerging again around those kind of, of operations. So uh, I think you have, to, you have to sort of look at the national interest and where it goes best for each country, of course. But... Uh, certainly, looking across Europe, the minilateral format is emerging. And, and this also goes, back to my last point, to the, the wider question, which is there is a big discussion, I think, emerging about the future of European security architecture. We haven't met, I think the, the foreign minister mentioned um, Ireland's involvement in the OSCE, which, which is, carries the principles of European security, agreed after the end of the Cold War and things like the, the Paris Charter. The OSCE is on its knees and it may not survive much longer. And so we're going to have to look at what is going to be the best new format. So there are already new ones emerging. The European political community had its second summit in Moldova. 
So again, there are other formats that could be looked at that are emerging, which countries could, may see opportunities to do things there, which may sort of address the, this shifting security environment in quite an effective way. Thank you. So I'll go back to the floor, yes. Um, thank you. Is the mic working? Yeah. Uh, Ray the Cronin, <coughs> Sinn Féin TD for North Kildare, and also uh, um, junior spokesperson on defence and a member of the foreign at the um, Iraqis Committee. Um, it seems to me, really, really listening to the debate here, that the greatest threat to global security is inequality. And um, I think it was very interesting, Renata, where you, where you mentioned there that the, you know, the source of Ireland's wealth at the moment, you know, it is coming globally, you, you, you could say. And um, <clears throat> our interconnectedness but the, the failure of equity is, is a huge problem. And as a country that has known inflicted hunger, that has known what, what it's like to be displaced, a um, country that has known what it's like to be sending money back, back, back home and all that. And I, we, I met Rachel there at, the, at our, our committee meeting um, during the week, and we were talking about the importance of home. But, you know, around preventing conflict, um, do you think, does the panel feel that our neutrality gives us, um, I don't like saying, you know, moral authorities for great, these great moral things, but our neutrality has to, you know, is central to our standing in the world thus far. And it seems to me that we're at a crossroads that we either choose equality and sharing and decent, basic, basic decency, or we choose to just build higher walls. And, you know, we, I think, the global community all laughed at Trump when he was talking about building his wall. But we, you know, that seems to be the choice that, that there is here and the, the direction which the country is steering is just to build higher walls, make armaments industries uh, more, more wealthy, when generally, when, when really the greatest threat to global security is inequality. And the pie is huge, there's plenty to go around, and um, if some people will stop taking such massive slices of it. And I, I just want to, if the panel could talk about how our neutrality has given us that standing and how we could use that to actually uh, pre prevent, pre prevent further, further wars. You know, when the conflict that, that is raging at the moment in Europe started, I think Turkey acted as negotiators. Why, why didn't Ireland stand up to, to do that? We were able to make peace in our own country. And more importantly, and the difficult part is keeping the peace, always, always, always was, and we were able for that. So why didn't we play a greater role in trying to negotiate peace at the start um, of this, this war in Europe? Because people dying, they're not statistics, they're people, they're mothers, fathers, children, and I think we should be playing a bigger role in that. Thank you. Anyone like... Bridget. So can I just say on, on the war in Ukraine, in the lead up to it, there was extraordinary <laughs> diplomatic engagement. Uh, the, particularly Berlin and Paris worked very hard and they got nowhere. And unfortunately, uh, from 2008 onwards, when uh, Russia invaded part of Georgia, the writing was on the wall. And despite all the diplomacy, and there was a lot of diplomacy. Nothing stopped those tanks crossing the border. So I think we've got to be, we've, we, we, it's, it's very easy to say we're neutral, we have the moral authority. But to be honest, we were, would be a non-player. Moscow would not take us seriously. And so we've got to be extremely careful. But I absolutely agree with you on the issues of equality in, in the international system. But again, the structural barriers are extraordinarily high because through history, the strongest solidarity in terms of redistributive welfare has only happened within states and within very few states in the world. So in fact, to get a social contract that is global, I mean, I remember the 1970s, the new economic and international economic order was the big topic of the 1970s. And so these are huge structured barriers because effectively what you're asking is for the Irish to say, we're too rich and therefore we change the, uh, we change the, the rules of engagement in the global economy. 
Now, people don't unfortunately vote for that. So I think the equity issues are huge, they're fundamental, and they are a source of, 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 of crisis. And uh, with climate change, it will be even worse. And uh, the international system must mitigate. But I think we are fooling ourselves if we think there can be something like a global social contract like you have within a state. Solidarity, is, is solidarity does work beyond the state, but it's extremely difficult and much thinner than it can be within a state. So I think there are big structural issues there. So it's not that I disagree with your premise, but I just, it's the how to get there. Maybe just on how to get there. I, I absolutely agree with you that Ireland engaging in issues around the justice, fairness and equity of our global international institutions is going to be critical for their legitimacy and functionality going forward. And so the debates around the structure of the international financial institutions, uh, the debates around IMF, or World Bank, debt crisis, issues around climate financing. I would love to see Ireland actively engaged in those debates. And I think it requires us to rethink what we mean by our development policy. We have a great commitment to leaving no one behind and to helping the poorest of the poor, which I think is critical because everybody loves to back the winners, like Kamala Harris's trip to Africa, it was like backing the winners. Well, we do need to think about the, those least behind. But it would be great to see an Irish foreign policy that's engaged in some of these issues around structural inequality. That being said, I think that's quite significantly different from a debate about Ireland's security and your neutrality. And I think that your, does neutrality allow you to be that voice it certainly helps with some of it, but as Bridget said earlier, being a small state is a big part of what helps you with that debate. Being a generous state is what helps you with that, being an active state. And that's a bit different than neutrality policy or not as a security policy. So I think it's important not to mix the two. And just, just to add, oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I did no. want to let Rochelle yeah. come in on this because Thanks. inequality was a, you were the one who first raised it. If you don't mind. I think what gives Ireland our moral authority is consistency. And as Renata mentioned, uh, a better world is Ireland's development policy. But Ireland's support to advance human rights, combat poverty and hunger, as well as the commitment to peacekeeping and disarmament is an essential contribution to the world. I think also that consistency is reflected in uh, negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 and also co-facilitating the, um, the SDG Summit in September with Qatar. And that will be an effort, uh, a difficult effort, to try and get states to try and get back on track on some of the SDGs. We're so far off track in, in, in development progress. And I think it's also important that one of the SDGs is on um, uh, peace and security. So it is really important. And another example I think of where Ireland has been consistent in not just um, looking at uh, um, peace, but also looking at the impact of conflict on civilians. And Ireland brought 90 states to Dublin earlier this year um, to, uh, on the AWEPA declaration, which is on explosive weapons in populated areas. And it's those things that focus the mind on what, what conflict does to people and how it's so difficult to rebuild and protect people and try and help people to get their lives back on track once conflict happens. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I was just, uh, I think it's, it's useful to look at how conflict is changing internationally uh, because uh, I think it's entirely right that in the 1990s and 2000s, we saw a kind of global conflict was often about civil wars in some of the poorest countries in the world, which often were informed by inequality and, and the mechanisms that were developed, the multilateral peace operations and so on, uh, international in interventions were designed to address that. I think we've begun to enter a new world now in which those problems remain, but they're often uh, intersecting now with a return to great power confrontation, which is about other things. It's about the struggles for power, it's about creating new kinds of international order, uh, we see with China, for example, uh, it's not just uh, over Taiwan, but China is uh, undertaking a project to create its own institutions, its own new order, its own set of values, which, which goes, I think, far beyond the economic question. And, and so 
other types of responses are emerging around that. And so it's, it's entirely valid, of course, to have continued uh, engagement around peace mediation, uh, the peace operations, but alongside that idea, as I think I mentioned in my introductory comments, of deterrence and defense are actually, uh, in some contexts, the, the best way to ensure stability and peace, even though it may be a, a more confrontational world. That may be the actual, the reality is that to stop Russia is going to have to be a European strong deterrence and defense response because Russia, as we've seen, is not open to uh, diplomacy, it's not open to peace negotiations, and it's not just uh, European countries who've tried. Exactly. Indonesia has tried, China has tried, African states have just been there, so no one can break the, this deadlock. And so actually uh, building a secure Europe uh, and a wider stability in the world will require the Europe, many of the European countries to step up on, on those issues. Thank you. And just, okay. just very briefly, the Ukraine war is a failure of deterrence because when, uh, when Putin went into Georgia, nothing was done. Crimea, not enough was done. And so he didn't anticipate the response that he got. And so in other words, deterrence has a very important role. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, does somebody else have a mic on the floor? Yes, please. Thank you, Professor. And members of the panel, um, my name is Edward Horgan, and I'm a former UN peacekeeper. Our Irish government leaders, including our Taunist and Taoiseach, have assured us that Ireland will not join NATO, and Ireland will remain a military neutral state. Over 3 million RMD US troops have passed through Shannon Airport since 2001. This is not military neutrality. This is not neutrality of any sort, in fact. As confirmed by the High Court in 2003, we are being lied to by our government. Genuine neutrality needs to be restored and resurrected in accordance with the democratic wishes of the vast majority of the Irish people. Genuine positive active neutrality, which includes promoting international peace and justice, is something to be proud of, not ashamed of. Right now, all of humanity are facing existential crises due to environmental destruction, conflicts, risks of nuclear war, related refugee crises, poverty and famine, all been exacerbated by wars, including the dreadful war in Ukraine. Ireland has no capacity to be a military power, but great capacity to be peacemakers. That's why positive Irish neutrality is vital for the Irish people and for humanity as a whole. And finally, we are told by members of the panel that NATO is the only game in town from a European security point of view. How quickly have we forgotten, in fact, what NATO has done in the Middle East and elsewhere? Serbia in 99, Afghanistan over 20 years, Iraq, Libya and elsewhere. Millions of people have died, including one million children. Just think of it for a moment. There's a million children dead in the Middle East for causes due to war since the first Gulf War in 91. How can we justify that and what NATO is doing? NATO, in my view, is being used as uh, a sort of criminal enforcer for what almost amounts to a global <coughs> protection racket. Creating international peace and justice is what Ireland should and must be doing, not joining and supporting wars that are killing millions of people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'll take that as a statement rather than a question, so I'm going to invite a couple of more people from the floor. Yes. Uh, just to bring things down to maybe a, a ground pounder's perspective. Sorry, my could you tell my, us sorry, my name is Declan Power. I'm an independent security and defence analyst, former UN SIM card officer, a former Irish soldier. Uh, and on, on that note, just to, uh, I, I would agree with some of the comments made by our Sinn Fein colleague there about inequality. And I think one of the problems facing us, uh, and that's been you know, knocked out in this forum, is for Ireland to address those things, sometimes we have to find the right vehicle to get there on the ground. And uh, as a former soldier, uh, and having served in UN missions, I was in Darfur with the UN mission at a very uh, difficult time, uh, around the same time as the uh, EU mission was being deployed across the border in Chad. Uh, and a lot of people I was dealing with, a lot of, uh, a lot of Sudanese people were saying, you know, that, that mission has the right capacity. Why, why isn't, they knew I was Irish and they, they knew Ireland was leading that mission. Why isn't that happening here? Because the truth of the matter is the EU mission in Chad, it had a start, middle and end. It wasn't perfect, but it was successful. It worked. The UN mission uh, in Darfur was struggling. 
And the end result of that struggles uh, were deaths, you know, blood on the ground. Uh, the EU mission worked. If Ireland wants to make a difference, sometimes we have to find the right vehicles to get there. And just a note, I, NATO has somehow been, a, um, people can have their own opinions on, about it, but just in the interest of balance, Irish soldiers serving in Kosovo, one of them was a personal friend of mine, serving in Kosovo under a NATO banner saved the lives of Kosovar Muslims serving while they were serving with KFAR. It was under a NATO banner that those lives were saved. It was Irish soldiers that do, did it. They wouldn't have been there to do it had the NATO mechanism not existed. And it had a UN mandate as well. It had a UN resolution. My question, finally, uh, just to jump back to minilateralism. Is that not, is minilateralism not what PESCO allows us to do? That's my understanding of it. It allows clusters of nations, particularly small nations within the EU context and third nations, come together and cooperate on like-minded ideas. And for the life of me, I can't understand why Ireland, who has signed up to PESCO, has not utilized the heavy airlift capacity uh, option that is allowed through PESCO. So I'd be interested in your, uh, your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we respond, let's take one more. And I think we have a, an MEP, Claire Daines, there. OK, yeah, thanks very much. Um, and like Claire Daly, I'm a member of the European Parliament from Dublin. And I'd like to pick up maybe on some of the discussion that followed from Rita's um, contribution. And it is about the pivotal role of the war in Ukraine in terms of what you've said is changing the way in which Europe looks at this. Now, I think that's not actually true. I would say that the war has accelerated a path that Europe was already on, in that it has morphed into an area of militarism over the past number of years with the European Defence Fund, with all of the other mechanisms that it engaged on, and Putin's illegal invasion then, if you like, gave the excuse to accelerate that. Now, some comments were made after that, Bridget, I think, in particular, that war was a failure of diplomacy. And that's not actually accurate. I mean, what happened in 2008 and the role of NATO can't be ignored in this, where constantly, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a call from subsequent, multiple Russian presidents that expanding NATO towards Russia's border was a threat to their security. Every Russian president, I suppose, warned of that. And in 2008, NATO still said, despite the best advice of US generals and military people and diplomats, say, don't go there. That's provocative. But NATO went there in 08 by saying they would welcome Ukraine and Georgia. We had the Minsk Agreement subsequent to that, 2014. There's been you know, a civil war effectively in parts of Ukraine going back since 2014. Diplomatic efforts around Minsk weren't implemented. It's not true to say that only Russia wouldn't deal with that. Zelensky was elected on a platform of calling for a resolution of the conflict in the Donbass, but the international community didn't have his back in many ways, if you want to put it like that. I mean, there had been, there was a peace deal on the table in April. We know that the Israeli premier said last April, Russia, and Ukraine had agreed the outlines of a deal which would have allowed for Russian withdrawal in return for Ukrainian neutrality and a plan to deal with the complex issues of the Donbas and Crimea going over a period of 10 to 15 years. The US and NATO didn't allow that to happen. So I think we need to be accurate about this. It's not you can have diplomacy and you can have militarism. There is a consequence when you have militarism. I mean, I'd like the panel to say it's well understood that the United States, loads of people get killed in mass shootings. And why is that? Because there's loads of guns in US society. We accept that. Yet nobody seems to say that growing militarism actually leads to more wars rather than the opposite situation. We said Ireland was, you know, uh, hadn't engaged much on the security plane. We were one of the least securitized countries and we're one of the safest. There's a connection between those two things. I think that's really important. I mean, we're talking, and I think Neil said it, about being on the verge of a new great war conflict. But like De Valera was very clear that the role of small countries in that wasn't to be used in that. And that means equally, I don't want to be used by Russia, and I don't think that's going to happen, but I don't want to be used by NATO either. And the best contribution we can make 
as a, as a country that was formally colonized, yet a mature Western democracy, is to join the countries where the majority of the world's people lived, who've also experienced colonialism, and say, well, do you know what? We have to get it together. We have to talk to each other, even people we don't like. And we have to, as our constitution says, resolve matters diplomatically and peacefully. And you can't have the two go I think our president actually articulated that very well at the weekend. So I think it would be very wrong if the war happened because of a failure of diplomacy. Russia is responsible for the illegal invasion. There's no justification for that, but it has to be explained in the context of NATO expansion, which contributes. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of comments there to respond to, Neil. Uh, I can just respond on the Russia issue. Um, I mean, my career really started out working in the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe almost 30 years ago, one of these mechanisms that was set up to manage uh, the post-Soviet uh, situations. And I work particularly on this issue of the Russian diasporas outside Russia, as we see uh, the ethnic Russians in Ukraine and Crimea. Uh, and during my career, I saw Russia gradually disengaging from those mechanisms and taking on a, a new approach to its security policy, unfortunately, despite our, our best efforts to kind of find peaceful and, and multilateral solutions. And so I think if we look at what has happened now, I, mean, I think a number of points, I'd, I'd just like to, sort of, to qualify what was just said. Uh, there, has, there has been no civil war in Ukraine. There's been an invasion of Ukraine. There was no civil war in the East. It was a, a Russian civil war. So, so, so the, this is what, I mean, I traveled a lot in that area, and you talk to Ukrainians, whether they're Russian-speaking Ukrainians or Ukrainian-speaking uh, Ukrainians, they are committed to Ukraine, and they see this as a violation of their sovereignty, not as a civil war. It's a proxy uh, operation by, by Russian intelligence and, and military o operations. Secondly, on, on this security idea, I mean, Russia has certainly uh, articulated these concerns, but what they say, when you actually press beneath them, this isn't, has, hasn't been their concern. I was in Moscow the week before the, the war, and, and we engaged very highly with the Russian leadership. Uh, and of course, they would put out these uh, security draft security treaties. These are all false operations. I mean, those treaties were not real documents. And if you look at President Putin's speeches before the invasion, it was about reclaiming Russian uh, imperial territories. It was about the idea that Ukraine is not a real country, that Ukraine is not a real nation, and it's about regathering Russian lands. And so the, the whole security track and the idea that, that, that this was about and to NATO expansion was a propaganda line that was put out to justify the expansion of Russia. And that goes back to 2008 and the Russia-Georgia war. And I agree that, that, that actually the decision by NATO at that, that, at that summit was wrong because we, we did the worst of two possible worlds. We, we said that they could come into NATO, but we didn't commit to them coming into NATO. So it left this ambiguity. Either we should have put, you know, followed through and brought the countries in, or we should have not made the offer and just left them hanging. But my last point is actually on understanding the process of NATO enlargement. Uh, this is not a kind of a Washington-driven grand strategy. It's actually uh, the last 20 years has been NATO often being pulled into these countries by the agencies of the countries themselves because they feel vulnerable. I mean, the, the Baltic states felt vulnerable and they wanted NATO membership. Uh, you can see this, just look at the newspapers today. Every day the Ukrainian leadership is saying, we want NATO membership. Actually, it's Washington that is hesitant about this because they are trying to manage the risks. So the reality is that much of Europe feels threatened uh, clearly by Russia and rightly by Russia. And NATO is trying to manage that situation in the best way it can. It's not a sort of a, you know, as Moscow sees it, this idea that there is a kind of Anglo-Saxon expansionist agenda happening. Uh, this is really coming from the countries themselves. Could, could I maybe just add on Russia? And I also share your point and Neil's point that some aspects of the fluidity of the European security architecture of the last few years hasn't helped predictability. Uh, when I was heading the UN Institute of Disarmament Research, the breakdown of arms control agreements, the breakdown of strategic forces arrangements between US and Russia, led to a huge amount of uncertainty as to where nuclear warheads are going to be placed, how and what. So I agree with you that there has been unpredictability 
in each other's assessments of what's happening where. And it's in, in our collective interest to find some predictability. But I think you need to be very careful about assessing that Russia's actions are defensive, either in Ukraine or in relation to anything else. This has been accompanied by Russia querying the foundations of international order in lots of fora. Inside the UN Security Council, 11 vetoes on Syria, including on the most basic provisions of humanitarian aid. Vetoes on issues that prior had been areas where the P5 agreed were not of their critical importance for them security. I'm thinking about Burundi. When you had a regime mount an illegal transition of power, decided to extend power, and an attempt to do a mediation effort by the UN blocked in, in the Security Council, not because it was a critical security interest of Russia, but because Russia is challenging an order that it sees as US dominated and fundamentally not in its interest. So I think you have to look if we are committed to a global security environment that we need to think about, then you need to look at, at the set of behaviours of challenging those norms across all forms. And if you think about UN uh, commitments to peacekeeping right now, where are some of the sales to your Russian arms to, in Africa and the increase in some of those arms? And if you look at Russian paramilitaries in two places where UN peace operations are deployed, some of the most dangerous places, Mali and Central African Republic. So I think you need to look at the global security environment and Russia's challenges of those norms across the board. Bridget. Uh, can I? So I want to go back to the question of the, the EU, PESCO and the EDA. I think those in this country who talk incessantly about militarization and militarism of the EU are actually disrespecting our partners in the EU. They have set up cooperative structures that they feel are necessary to respond to the security environment they find themselves in. There is something called a European Defence Agency. It is a good thing. Europe spends an enormous amount on security, although it declined at the end of the uh, Cold War, and there was a peace dividend. But the sum is less than the parts. It actually is very ineffective. So the European Defence Agency and the Military and Security Committee are there to make sure that Europeans cooperate. PESCO, as, uh, as the member of the audience said, who knows far more about it than I do as someone who served in, in, in Darfur, and saw EU missions. PESCO is there to allow countries to do things that they should be doing together, to gain knowledge, capability, capacity. This country cannot bring home its people from any conflict zone in the world without relying on other countries. So I, my, I have a very deep plea to all of those who bandy words like militarism and militarization, as if somehow or other that countries that feel they need to work for their own security, which includes hard security, are somehow that we're better than them. And we're just very lucky. And our luck may not last because our world is very unpredictable. And the one area that we probably haven't spent enough time on today is the consequence of the climate crisis and all the unpredictability that that will bring in our world. But we shouldn't, this bad faith image that is perpetrated by some people in this country, that there are all these warmongers out there no one, no rational, sane human being wants war. And if there were, just like the world banned slavery, if the world could ban conflict and war, wouldn't it, that be a much better world? But I'm realistic enough to know that that's not an available future that I, that I see at the moment. So my plea when it comes to discussing the EU is not to use the lazy opt-out of militarization and militarism. The European defense agency is a good thing. PESCO is a good thing. And we shouldn't be afraid of it. We shouldn't run from it. But we should be very transparent about our involvement in it. And if there are projects we're involved in, fine, be open about it. And if there are projects we don't want to be involved in, also say so. But be transparent. But don't take the lazy option of this bad faith image as if somehow or other we're better. 
We're just lucky. We're out of time, but I'd like to give you a chance for some closing remarks. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the... This is a really valuable com conversation. One of the commitments that Concern makes to communities that we work with is that we will bring their voices and their perspectives into conversations like this. Um, and recently, we've been doing some work with young people in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Haiti, and Somalia. <clears throat> and we asked them what they needed to overcome food insecurity and build a sustainable future. Safety, education, employment, recreational spaces, reconstruction of our countries, and durable solutions to displacement. That's what they asked for. They also spoke of um, the need to organize for change, the need for positive global leadership that provides hope, accountability, and an alternative to violence and conflict. And I think that's a good point to end. And I would add one point is that sustainable development can't be realized without peace and security. And peace and security will be at risk without sustainable development. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm afraid there are quite a few questions we didn't get to, but I very much hope that over the course of the next four days, those of you who didn't get your questions addressed will have an opportunity to do so. Um, we are going to take a break now for half an hour, but the next session will begin at 11.30. You should be in your seats, if you would, by 11.25. The next speakers will be Andrew Cotty, Patricia Lewis, Kate Fearon, and Gary Murphy. I'd like to invite all of them up here to get mic'd up. And uh, please join me in thanking our panel and enjoy the break.
Testing. 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 Uh, hello, folks. Uh, could we ask those who are standing, could they please take their seats? And we're going about to resume, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. I see the last few people coming in here in the room. Um, thank you very much for joining us for uh, the second session of uh, the forum. Uh, my name is Suzanne Lynch. I'm a journalist with Politico, usually uh, based in Brussels, uh, but uh, here for this event today. And I'm delighted to be chairing uh, the second panel. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Our topic is European security post-Russian invasion of Ukraine and the implications for Ireland. So starting in no particular order, we're joined by Gary Murphy, Professor of School of Law and Government at DCU. Uh, Kate Fearon, Deputy Director, Policy Support of the OSCE Conflict Prevention Centre. Andrew Cotty, Jean Monet Chair here at UCC. And Patricia Lewis, Research Director of Interna International Security at Chatham House. So thanks very much uh, for joining us. Look, it, it's a big topic. It's a, it's a general uh, kind of theme at uh, this session. But we're going to try and get down to some specifics. Uh, one of the uh, aspects of... European security we're going to discuss here is the OSCE, um, Ireland's membership of the OSCE. So I'm going to start with Kate Fearon. Um, Kate, maybe you just start by kind of explaining a bit. I mean, a part of this forum is about information, about objective facts. And I am aware that a lot of people here in Ireland know so much about the EU, so much about NATO, but the OSCE is less well known. Maybe just give us a, a bit of an introduction to what the OSCE is, what it stands for and what it does. Um, thank you very much, uh, Louise. Thanks for the invitation to be with you here today. So the OSC, as was uh, mentioned earlier, is um, the world's largest regional security operation um, organisation. Um, and it has a number of unique features that I think um, makes it quite different from the EU, although uh, the EU27 are all uh, participating states, um, and from the other, uh, the other um, countries which are part of the uh, OSCE. So there are 57 uh, participating states uh, in the OSC, the 27 EU, but also um, uh, many other countries in Europe, um, but uh, uh, also in Central Asia, Southeast Europe, the South Caucasus, and of course um, the US, the UK, the Russian Federation are all on board. So it's really uh, one of the very few platforms that has that kind of wide range from Vancouver through to Vladivostok, as we say. Um, the, the, a really a wide range of people and uh, countries and interests um, that, that we have. And the other unique feature is that we take very much a comprehensive view of security. So for us, it's not uh, just, we heard this morning, people refer to hard security and soft security, but we take a very comprehensive approach to security. So, uh, and we arrange these in three pillars or dimensions. So we have our political military uh, dimension, so the traditional uh, area under which we would discuss things like um, the proliferation of small arms and light weapons or stockpiles of conventional uh, uh, arms, for example. Uh, but we also have our second dimension issues, which are uh, where we take account of and we work to address economic and environmental concerns, what are the security implications uh, of these, and then the, the human dimension, so promotion of, of, of human rights. We have a number, we have a secretariat that's based in Vienna, but we have another a number of independent um, uh, autonomous institutions, so looking at, for example, uh, freedom of the media um, all, uh, in the OSC area, looking at um, elections, so election observation mission would be part of what we would do as well. Um, and then in terms of the, um, the, the work, um, we have a platform for political accountability. So every week in Vienna, all of the um, uh, representation, all of the participating states represented in Vienna, they will meet to have political discussions, not just in the room, um, but maintaining the relationships that are necessary uh, for diplomacy um, and dialogue to, uh, to be fostered even outside of the room. Um, we have 12 uh, field operations um, throughout um, the OSC regions, and we have a lot of project work that are based on the themes 
um, to promote the OSC values. So for example, we do work on things as wide ranging from uh, environmental protection to combating traffic in human beings. So it's a very wide range of things. And then we also support a number of the P um, uh, peace, peace platforms, so confidence building platforms. Um, we support the Geneva International Discussions on the, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the outcome of the, the war in, uh, in Georgia, so the relationship in the Georgian context. Um, previously, um, we were supporting the Minsk format in the relationship between uh, the Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia. After 2014. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we are also um, assist with the um, discussions between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, so with yeah. some of these things we are... Um, uh, we are co-facilitating, we're chairing, we're supporting. So there's all of those things. And for example, Ireland is, um, as we said, we, we're a small country, but this year Ireland is chairing the Human Dimension Committee. So Ireland gets to uh, convene the participating states to set the agenda on human rights and, and other mm. issues. So really, it's a really good uh, yeah. platform for doing that. So much more holistic, a very broad idea yeah. of European security mm -hmm. that emerged, you know, in the 70s, 80s, kind of. And, 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 mm -hmm. But one of the, and Ireland is obviously a member there, and all those different elements, I know, personally, the election monitoring is something that I'm familiar with, the OSCE does. Of course, one of the other things about the OSCE is that Russia is a member of it. So in this way, it's quite like the U. It, it's it, comparable to the UN in that you know you've got this broad membership, and then I suppose there's an argument: is it good to have, you know, Russia at the table for these, or does that stop decision making happening? Like I, in our last panel, we heard uh, from one of the panelists saying the OSCE is on its knees. You know, so how effective is the OSCE, and is it an issue when you have all the, the have such a wide membership? Yeah. Uh, yes, I noted that Neil said that in the earlier. I couldn't resist <laughs> writing earlier. it down. <laughs> Quite the headline. <laughs> so thanks for in, uh, giving me the opportunity to, to address that. So um, the OSC takes decision uh, by what's called in European terms consensus, but I think more accurately is unanimity is how decisions on, on big issues uh, are taken. And uh, with uh, the Russian Federation around the table, that means that one country can, can block um, uh, the, I think that there are some challenges with the bureaucracy of the OSC. So at the moment, we're having difficulties with adopting a budget, which enables us to do the kind of work that, we're, that we uh, are doing. So um, yes, there are challenges. Um, but I think we need to recall that the OSC came about um, in the depths of the Cold War. Um, and when uh, knowing that you really need to um, have a channel for uh, relationships to remain open, even if those relationships yeah. are um, uh, not um, not particularly strong uh, at the moment, but there needs to be continually, uh, mm -hmm. continually a reach, uh, reaching out. And we had some discussion earlier about our own experience um, of having uh, been an, an island uh, that, that has uh, experienced uh, conflict relatively recently. Um, and I, I recall, um, you know, one of the things I was involved in the in our own peace process, and this idea of always um, have maintaining a relationship for the day will come when there will be a reduction of hostilities between uh, Russia and uh, after Russia's um, uh, war against Ukraine. It will be a ceasefire, it will be a reduction in hostility, of what we like to call frozen conflicts, but they're never really frozen. Um, but that day will come yeah. and we need to keep this platform alive for, for when that happens. Gary Murphy, what do you think about this? It's kind of a broad team. Uh, you know, is it better to have Russia at the table or is it not? I mean, one of the differences is that the EU or NATO doesn't have Russia um, at the table, obviously, uh, whereas organisations like the OSCE, where Ireland's a member, and the UN does. Well, I think it's a, that's a, a tough question, to put it mildly, and not easily answered. I mean, it, it goes back to one way to Claire Daly's point this morning from the... Uh, uh, from the floor, is it better to have a country which I think most people think uh, is in, engaged in a barbarous war, uh, in uh, an illegal war in uh, in Ukraine at the uh, at the table? But it also goes to the question of, as a small state with a history of neutrality, and we can discuss what neutrality means uh, in a minute. Do we have some authority, moral or otherwise, uh, to try and bring large states? Uh, to the uh, to the table, and in one way, I would like to think yes, of course, uh, we do, and that would be a good thing. And in that context, you know, I think I'm in favour 
um, I, I don't think I know, I certainly am in favour of trying to talk to uh, states like, uh, like Russia, but when you have someone like Putin in charge who doesn't seem to want to listen, and it goes to the heart of the earlier session, and I repeat it now again, the war in Ukraine is a failure uh, of diplomacy, but in one way because President Putin doesn't listen. Yeah, and he I suppose... listens to a certain amount of people around his, uh, his very large table in, uh, uh, in Moscow. And in that context, I think it's very difficult for a small state like Ireland, which has a, you know, one way, a proud history of, of neutrality, although I'm sceptical of it in, in some ways. Um, but yeah, but to go to the heart of your question, Suzanne, I think it's better... Yeah. Uh, to engage and, uh, than to just remain uh, on the side and say, let's hope it'll all be resolved and then we can go back to a sort of a virtuous yeah. position looking on. I mean, there are big historical questions here about appeasement over the years. I mean, the Baltic nations would say all the time, well, look where appeasement got, you know, how much do you engage? And, and like, these are the no straight answers to these. No, they're, they're not. It, when somebody like Putin is... And I mean, I think it's also important it came up in the last... The, the Ukraine war didn't just start last year. This was part of, you know, a much earlier process as well. And going back to 2008. Yeah. Um, but also, of course, at the heart of the question about, uh, about ideas in foreign policy and where does Ireland want to stand? Uh, and where does Ireland want to stand in uh, battles between uh, aggressors and those who are aggressed against? And uh, I think that's very important for a forum like this uh, to address. And Ireland cannot stand uh, to go back to what Bridget Lavin said, we have been lucky, but we just cannot stand aside and pretend it's got nothing uh, to do with us, when of course it has a lot to do with us, when we have 80,000 people and perhaps more uh, coming yeah. here to try and make new lives away uh, from being killed. Yeah. Um, Patricia, just to change slightly, and we might come back to this whole idea about the OSCE and its, uh, you know, its ideals, its principles, but does it actually achieve much? I suppose it's kind of a, a central question. Um, but on another issue, which is the issue of the nuclear threat, mm. Um, particularly now, we've just seen, you know, Russia move, saying it's moving, uh, you know, nuclear uh, capabilities into Belarus. You know, you're an expert in this field. How do you assess uh, the, the state of nuclear disarmament at the moment? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's not great. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I would say that um, what we're seeing uh, in this particular conflict is where, how nuclear weapons are used as a weapon of fear, as a weapon of threat, a weapon of compellence. I think for too long we've been very lazy about nuclear weapons generally in the West. Ireland with an, is a big exception here, let me just say, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But you know, we, we've, we've tended to be very lazy and, and talk about nuclear weapons in the same breath as deterrence. In fact, in the UK, it's the, wep the nuclear weapon system we have is called the deterrent. Right? Mm. It doesn't even have the word nuclear in front of it anymore, as if nothing else deterred. And, and this has allowed everyone to kind of forget about all the other aspects of deterrence, which is so much more important, all the other aspects of conflict prevention, which, which work, which may not work, and, and just sort of rely in a very lazy way on something that we don't know works and is now being used against us, right? Mm. So what I'd like to say here is that this is an area where Ireland has excelled and where Ireland has been able to show extraordinary leadership um, and been able to uh, leverage its uh, standing in the UN, uh, its standing in the international community in Europe, and being able to achieve a huge amount. I mean, many people in this room will know, but perhaps not everyone watching online will know, the importance of Ireland in developing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Yeah. It was the Irish resolution in the General Assembly that brought that in the 1960s. And ever since then, Ireland has played a really central role in that whole debate. Uh, bringing in lots of other treaties, including very recently the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons. Um, and this is a very controversial treaty. Um, at the moment, uh, many in NATO would say that you can't be a member of that treaty, and of course Ireland is a good standing member of that treaty, and be a member of NATO. So that debate may already be settled. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of Western government. countries didn't. So, yeah, yeah, but it's really worrying, because I think at the moment what we're seeing is on the bilateral side, Russia pulling out of all of these treaties. Yeah, that's a big, I mean, ultimately, the, you know, the Russian nuclear threat, this is what does make it different from other conflicts? Yeah. It is Russia's nuclear capabilities. Yes, and we're, we're I mean, really, one way, but it, it is. We, we really do need to, we need to take it seriously, but not play into the hands of being frightened. Yeah. It's such a difficult thing to do. And um, we are having a big debate in Moscow at the moment, and I don't know if people have been reading this debate that's been going on over the last few days where um, a very, a, a very well-known uh, Moscow academic and, uh, if you like, political insider has come up with the idea that Russia should conduct 
This has been proposed before, but it's again from Belarus now, a demonstration nuclear weapon explosion to show how serious they are. And now, of course, you've got uh, others rushing to say, yes, 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 this is a really good idea, and this is how we should do it. And then you've got others saying, oh, well, hang on a minute, you're drinking your own Kool-Aid here. Have you any idea what might happen if, if we do that? And, and uh, so this is a very live debate in Russia right now. And I think it's a debate in which we need to engage. Mm, yeah. Um, Andrew Carty, what's your view on this kind of, you know, I suppose the unique nature, if you like, of this rush, of this particular conflict that's happening now, and what that means for European security, whether it be on the nuclear front or the fact that it's on the doorsteps of NATO? Thank you. So, I mean, I think I maybe start going back to one of the questions that you raised with Gary about should we engage with yeah. Russia? And I think, in my mind, the answer is very clear. It's not, you know, either you have defence or deterrence or you do engagement. It's actually you need both. And even in the midst of the war, you know, the Americans, very quietly, pretty senior American officials from time to time are still talking to the yeah. Russians about various things. So there is still an element of diplomacy. So, you know, there are very good reasons if you, you know, why we're supporting, the West is supporting Ukraine. There are very good reasons why NATO is strengthening its defences in Poland, Baltic states and so on. But you also need this parallel um, strategy of engagement, which is there. And in particular, I think one needs to be open to the point when one can have a meaningful conversation with Russia. That may not be for quite a long time, but as a matter of principle, one needs to be open to it. And maybe then to just step back a bit, and this was raised in, in the previous panel, um, if you look at sort of the history of the last, let's say, 30 years, Kate obviously mentioned the OSCE. That was one means of engaging with um, Russia. There were also substantial EU efforts to engage with Russia and NATO efforts yeah. to enga engage with Russia. So it's not as if the West didn't try for a 30-year period to engage with Russia. And maybe then just one other point, the, the, this issue of NATO enlargement was the Ukraine war caused by NATO enlargement was raised. And yes, NATO enlargement is part of the question and there's a legitimate debate to be had about that. But for me, the core of the issue is that Russia has not accepted the independence of Ukraine and other former Soviet states. It still has a neo-imperial um, policy towards those, straight, those, those states. Don't take my word for it. If you don't believe that, listen to the words of President Vladimir Putin. Read President Putin's July 2021 mm. essay on Russo-Ukrainian Russo relations. And if you want to find it, it's in Russian and in English on the Russian presidency website. And very clearly in that essay, President Putin effectively says that Ukraine is not an independent state. Russia does not accept Ukraine's independence. And for me, that's really... As I say, we can debate NATO enlargement, but for me, continuing Russian neo-imperial attitude towards Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, is very much the heart of the issue. And I hope that one day we will see a democratic Russia, which will be in a position to live in peace with Ukraine and its other neighbours. But in the meantime, we're in very challenging circumstances mm -hmm. because, because that isn't the case. I mean, that's a very good point you raise. And I probably, I was a bit, uh, Gary, I put that question on you, the black and white, do you engage or don't you with Russia? I mean, the, you're, you're right in that. I remember myself being present at EU-Russia summits where Putin was in Brussels meeting his counterparts quite, re you know, relatively recently in the last 10 years. So there wa it wasn't as if they were in the G8 as it then was, the G20, that's another forum. Um, and they're obviously at the UN as well. Uh, but I suppose there is an argument then, and again, probably not any direct answer to this, about do you confer legitimacy then on Vladimir Putin by having them in the OSCE and blocking everything and actually stopping the OSCE to do their work? And, and can an organisation that Ireland's a member of, like the OSCE, like the UN, really... Does it really cut the mustard when it comes to something like a nuclear threat? I mean, what would you say to that, Kate, as the OSE person on the, on the panel? Um, I think that one of the important things that OSC provides is a platform for political accountability. And uh, each week, um, the Russian Federation representatives 
have to sit and listen to what the other delegates, including the Ukrainian delegation, have to say about the situation with the war against Ukraine. And uh, the reason why I think that's, it may sound like it is a small thing, but it, the reason why it's important is that so much of the time, people are speaking to their own echo chambers and they're, they're choosing which narrative to hear. So actually having to hear the narrative of the other. Um, and it, these are very difficult debates to listen to sometimes um, and to hear where exactly the position of the EU27, the US, the UK, um, and the other um, and the other significant European uh, uh, partners um, are, are are on the particular thing. It's 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 something that they don't hear uh, yeah. every day. So I think that's one important thing. Um, the other part of where um, the OSC work comes into play is our relationship with the Central Asian Five. So the Central Asian partners. One of the things that we're doing there is really promoting um, connectivity across the northern route from. Um, uh, for uh, for trade. So this is the stand, the Kazakhstan. And so other, yeah. yeah, so it's Kazakhstan, um, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, and Kyrgyzstan. Who geographically are just right there. Well, uh, and yeah. Geographically and geopolitically, bit right between Russia and China. So, you know, these are realms of influence that, uh, or these are uh, political realms that we all seek to influence. Um, and so very, th those countries are in a very uh, difficult, um, uh, or in a very... Um, they can be um, uh, caught in the middle uh, between two, um, but they are very much part of the, the OSC family. And uh, we um, are supporting work in um, uh, project work on connectivity, on economic development, on trying to assist with uh, climate change, um, which is a really w water management and transboundary water management, particularly with the border uh, with Afghanistan. Um, these are all important elements that the OSC yeah. can assist those uh, those countries with. Patricia, you were going to come in there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what we've seen over the, um, the decades with nuclear weapons, for example, has been a dependence on luck as a strategy, which is not a great strategy. But luck is about um, preparing for opportunity. And, and what we see at the UN, for example, is you're right, absolutely right. It's the same at the OAC, that Russia does get exposed to the different views. Whether they get back to Moscow in that form, <laughs> I doubt. But nonetheless, there is this opportunity, and they are you know, confronted with the reality of the decision-making. Everyone is, uh, equally. And so this is really important. So as a venue, in that sense, they can't say they, know, know, they don't know what people's views are. And then I would say the other thing which is really important about preparing for opportunity is the back channels. And if we didn't have these organizations that are extant there, where, yes, they're very difficult, we can't make decisions right now in, in, a, in a meaningful way, but we have the back channels. We do not know what's going to happen in Russia. We do not know what opportunities we might be presented with. We need to be prepared. We need to have those connections so that when things do change, that we're ready and able to use those connections. So I would say that this is one of the most important things in the international community and international organizations that we mm. need to keep them for and invest in them. And, and, and this is the argument that came up before about whether to expel the Russian ambassador from, from countries. Could I just add, sorry, yeah. uh, Suzanne, yeah. I mean, to go to this question of uh, will Moscow take any notice of anything that happens here in Ireland or, or in Dublin in, or, or Parliament or at governmental level, I mean, the Soviet Union, as it was, did take notice of Ireland before. It had obviously vetoed Irish membership of the UN until 1955. In the mid-1980s, Dublin was on a very short list of about three uh, to host the Reagan-Gorbachev uh, summits, and it wasn't doing that because it was firmly in the, uh, in the Western Bloc. Um, so it does listen, and it has historically listened to, uh, to Dublin. That's not to say that the current incumbent has any interest in listening to us, but I do think, go back to Matt Carthy's point, um, that historically... You know, our, our position in the world has counted uh, for something and probably still, uh, still does and can. Although the argument that was made somewhere in the last session was that by the very nature of being in the EU, that, that, that may be perceived well, right we were wrongly the, we, as... We were in the European community as it was dead in the, in the mid-1980s and that didn't stop yes, us from having an independent uh, foreign policy. And it goes much wider, of course, than uh, and simply Ukraine about whether we can stand on the sidelines or, or play an active, uh, a positive role. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, you were... So, I mean, maybe two, two points. One is 
just about the OSCE, because as was Kate mentioned at the beginning, people won't be familiar with it, but one of the things that the OSCE does is a whole range of conflict prevention, conflict resolution, democracy promotion, human rights building. So in places like Bosnia, Kosovo, Central Asia, the Caucasus, there are OSCE small civilian missions, not military missions, doing a whole bunch of things that, I mean, Kate will know very well, it's extremely challenging work mm -hmm. at the political level, and it's extremely challenging work for those mm -hmm. people in, in, in the mm -hmm. field, and Russia sometimes vetoes some of this stuff, but nonetheless, you know, in a, in a low-profile way, the OSCE does some important and very worthwhile mm -hmm. long-term work. So I suppose just to sort of raise that flag for the, for, yeah. for the, for, for the OSCE in that sense that, you know, it, it's not something high-profile and certainly not usually sexy if we put it, put it like that, but it does do important and often maybe unheralded work. And then maybe just in terms of Ireland, um, some of the discussion earlier maybe was framed, to my mind, too much in a kind of either or. Either Ireland can do the UN and or it's you know doing stuff with the the EU and NATO. And it seems to me it it it's both and and uh, in different circumstances. And just maybe to give three examples, if you think about the UN and the recent. Um, Irish two-year term as a non-permanent member of the Security Council, one of the things which the Irish diplomats worked very hard, and ultimately at least with a degree of success on, was what's referred to as cross-border humanitarian access across the border between uh, Turkey and Syria. Kind of gets very technical and so on, but actually that's about trying to ensure that the world can provide humanitarian assistance to people in appalling circumstances. So that's somewhere where the UN is the appropriate vehicle yes. and Ireland can really work with it. But then to give two other examples, um, if you think about the Russia-Ukraine war, Ireland is part of the EU sanctions on Russia. And for me, that's both morally and strategically the right place to be. So, you know, that's the EU. And then to give a third example, as I think was mentioned earlier, I think by, by, by Declan Power, um, in the late 1990s and I guess into the 2000s, Irish personnel served with the NATO-led mission in Kosovo, which has helped to stabilize um, the situation in, in, in Kosovo. So, so for me, I, I think it's not kind of UN or it's, you know, Ireland can contribute via the UN, which absolutely is, is an important and very valuable, but also it can work as a member of the EU and sometimes it may, may work with NATO as well. Mm, I mean, I think that's, you got a key issue for this discussion we're going to have over the next few days, which is, you know, what is Ireland a member of? What do those different forums do? Is it enough for some people? Is it not? You know, but you're right about the EU. I know from covering, but the EU's power is economic. And that's what the EU does. It's the single market. It's one of the biggest economic blocks in the world. So it was able to respond to Russia aggression in a very different way than NATO is going to respond, in a very different way than the OSC is going to respond, and in a very different way than the UN is going to respond. So Ireland has obviously taken a political decision to, to go with those sanctions. I mean, everybody backed the sanctions. They've just passed the 11th sanctions package yesterday in Brussels. They all took a bit of negotiations between countries because each country, some countries are more exposed to others than others to Russian trade, but it ended up having this massive impact um, when the EU worked collectively. So I suppose that is one way to respond to the Russian aggression, even if it's nothing to do with the, with the military uh, field. Um, I might start uh, just opening up. We've loads of questions coming in, but maybe we'll start uh, on the floor. There's a uh, gentleman here. We might take a couple together. And if you could introduce yourselves, that'd be great. And then I see Deirdre Clune up there as well. After maybe we'll take two together. Oh, yeah, I'm just a, an ordinary person. My That's name. good. <laughs> That's what we want. Not affiliated with anybody. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm just, I suppose, like every country has their own self-interests. Um, like, I'm not very good at public speaking, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> um, Russia kind of, sorry, like you were saying there, Andrew, I think, Andrew, you were saying that uh, that uh, every country has 
the right to, um, oh geez, I'm getting all, <laughs> all over the place, sorry. How, do, how does a neutral country decide who is right and wrong? Surely the people should decide who, who is right in a de democratic country. Do you know, it shouldn't be a case of we just decide at government level or from this panel. Surely the people should get a, vo a voice. The people in, of, of Ireland in this case. Should... And like when it comes to, to uh, Russia threat, threat with nuclear weapons, like how back in the Cuban Missile Crisis, US kind of objected strongly to nuclear weapons being positioned on their border, and they invaded Cuba. So you can kind of see from Russia's point of view, they didn't want nuclear weapons going into Ukraine. So, do you know who decides who is right and wrong? That's a good question, the nuclear. Maybe we'll go to Deirdre Clune next, yeah. and then we'll go to the... Um, thanks, Suzanne. Deirdre Clune's my name. I'm a member of the European Parliament for Fine Gael, and uh, thank the panel. I, I am somebody who believes that you have to engage in all these four as best we can, the, the OEC, the OSCE, um, UN, another one is the Council of Europe. Um, uh, and I think that's very important to, to engage and to have channels open. I just like to as another in, in, in an area that I think is very interesting in our country is China and how it's in its relationship with Russia, because um, you know it's obviously playing playing a, a game here. What what game is it playing? Uh, it sees itself. I know it's one of the major world super returning to that superpower position. Um, so it has strong engagement with Russia. Africa, South America, and, and how do you, how do you, and I can give some insight on how we position ourselves, how does Ireland do it, how does the European Union do it, we have the statements on uh, de-risking but decoupling, not decoupling, I mean that's very important I suppose from a, from a trade point of view, but at the same time I think China is going to be, is a very significant question in, in all this, um, the situation with Russia and Ukraine. I'd like yeah, your insights, great. if you could. Thank you. Great. Could I we, could I answer yeah. the question from from about uh, about re re representation and yeah. uh, and um, first neutrality? Yeah, the first question. Yeah. And, and we're all ordinary people ourselves. We just have certain talents. So, uh, but the problem I think in uh, in relation to that is. Uh, you know, events happen and they happen very quickly and they have to be reacted quickly. That's why we have governments, that's why we vote them in and we can vote them out. Um, and you know, I think security should be an important element on the, uh, on the agenda for the, uh, the next general election. And this, uh, this, uh, this forum should hopefully clarify uh, debates in, uh, in that matter. But as it is, we are a representative democracy and we have, we have we vote in a representative government which acts on, on our behalf. Sometimes it's accused of uh, acting in uh, bad faith. Seems to be the case for, for some people uh, in this, uh, in, in relation to what we're, uh, where we are today. Um, but I'm not sure there's any other way of doing it. Now, the question that sometimes is often posed, should we put neutrality uh, into the Constitution? But we, you know, things get put into the Constitution and we know from other debates, they get taken out 35 years later when times change and mores change uh, and the like. So putting things into the Constitution is grave uh, with risk. But, you know, would, it, would we want not to take a side on a whole range of issues on Israel-Palestine? Would we not want to take a, a side? You know, so these are the dangers, I think, with some, um, what I would describe as a, a, a kind of a virtue signal by putting, a, by putting neutrality into the Constitution. But what would it mean and how would we be able uh, to react? And I have great faith in people, like all of us here, uh, when, when we come to vote at the next election, these things should be in our, uh, in our minds. A well, good point. Is neutrality, does it extend to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Would that... Would it mean that? What would it mean? Well, what would it mean? A... Exactly. And what does it mean for a whole range of conflicts, many of which yeah. Kate eloquently described at the beginning with the OSCE yeah. uh, plays? Well, how about in relation to, to Kosovo? There are a whole range of things. Where, where, uh, would, 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 excuse me, would we constrain ourselves yeah. as acting as an independent actor in good faith across the globe uh, by putting something into the Constitution. Yeah, yeah, interesting point. Do you want to come in on the nuclear just, there? To, just very quickly, just, just for clarity, yeah. because I think it's a really important point. Uh, so there are no nuclear weapons in Ukraine at the moment, right? Now, now Ukraine had Russian leftover weapons mm. at the end of the Cold War, and they were given back to, to Russia <laughs> under the Budapest Memorandum. We all know what happened to that. But now, to say what Russia has done now is move in, or, or said it's moved in, um, nuclear warheads into Belarus, um, now, what they say that the equivalence of, and this is important, is the US uh, regional or tactical, if you like, nuclear weapons in uh, Western European countries such as Belgium, uh, Germany, and uh, so on. There's about 100 of them, an estimate. Um, and that's what they say is equivalent to. And that's an argument to be had. I think the problem is that we are seeing this move of these nuclear warheads 
in a time of conflict, in a time when the nuclear weapons are being threatened. And that's a, that's a, a different concern. I think if the US were to be doing that now, that would be seen as escalatory. And I think we need to see Russia's actions in that way as escalatory, and at, at, at best, unwise. Um, but just, just to make sure that we understand yeah. that there are no nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think you... But um, on, on the... Ch just might segue into the China uh, point. I mean, China has been increasing its nuclear uh, capabilities. It has. In um, the last few months. Years. Well, years. And, years and, and, and it's, it looks like it's going to continue. I've actually got a few numbers. Yeah, I think this numbers. is interesting. <laughs> I think it's a really good point, dear De Kloon, yeah. made so by Ch China. China at the moment is estimated to have some, some sort of 400, 400 410 warheads. Um, and Russia at the moment has some 4,500 warheads. Uh, the US um, has some 3,700 warheads. So okay, good. you can see the discrepancy there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the UK you know, would have about 225, but 120 odd um, operational. France about 300, India 160, Pakistan 160. Mm. So that gives you your, your sort of your, your, your Scorecard, yeah. if you like. If you I mean, on the China, I think there's an interesting economic point. In the last panel, someone mentioned Ireland's big trade with China. I mean, there are kind of geopolitical stroke, ethical, moral questions about Ireland's, you know, one could ask about Ireland's trade policy. You know, if you're, if you're doing that much business with a country like China, and this is a huge debate now in Brussels, and it's a very, very sensitive debate. If some countries like Germany have huge exports to China, others saying we need to be tougher on China. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see where Ireland positions itself on that. Uh, does it take a strong uh, stance on human rights abuses, for example, when it, you know, and, it, and also wants to keep the trade relationship open. Does anyone want to come in about China and Russia and the kind of that impact? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think it brought my, my, my reading of China is that if you look at China over the last decade or so, so the kind of Xi Jinping era, although perhaps starting earlier, China has become significantly more authoritarian and repressive internally, reference to Xinjiang, um, but, you know, other issues, and China has become more assertive externally. Look at China's building militarization of islands in, islands in the South China Sea, look at China's military exercises around Taiwan. So for my money, China's behavior has become more problematic and, you know, for those of us in the democratic world, if we use that, that language, um, you know, relations with China are, go are going to be um, difficult and, you know, we probably do need to do things like de-risking, as Ursula von der Leyen, the um, European Commission president, puts it in terms of some of our economic relations with China. But again, it maybe goes back to the earlier point about engagement. We need a dual strategy of kind of responding in a sense with, if you like, defensive measures, maybe in the economic field, whilst also engaging with mm. uh, and um, talking to, to China. Mm. And maybe then separately, as the, yeah. the, 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 the neutrality question was, was mentioned, um, if anyone wants to read some of my views, you can read my article in the Irish Examiner today. <laughs> but the article is entitled, So Just What Is Neutrality? And my key point in that is that there is no single or agreed definition of neutrality. Neutrality is a slippery concept that means a variety of different things to different people in uh, different contexts. So that's part of the problem, I think, with the neutrality debate is that depending who you are and what you think, you know, person A may understand that neutrality means this, person B may understand that neutrality means that, and in a sense, neither of them is right, neither of them is wrong. It's a broad concept which ha has, has mul multiple meanings. Um, and I, therefore, I, I kind of question whether putting it in the Constitution mm. would be helpful. In a sense, it wouldn't really resolve that question because even if you put the word neutrality in the Constitution, it doesn't tell you how you should position yourself vis-a-vis -vis China or how you should position yourself on the yeah. Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah. It's an interesting point. I mean, on that, just a few things coming. If somebody picked up, the, it's, a, it's a good question, discussion of appeasement. Would the panellists describe Kennedy's diplomacy at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis as appeasement? Well... Our histo our, I'm, I'm leaving you with our historian here, Gary. Well, um, <laughs> he certainly had to... He, uh, he didn't appease those generals of his in his situation room who wanted to, uh, to use nuclear uh, weapons. 
uh, and uh, he showed an extraordinary uh, deftness in, uh, in manoeuvring his way, as, to be fair, did uh, the Khrushchev in manoeuvring a way out of, you know, the, the closest the world has come to, uh, to the use of, uh, uh, of nuclear weapons, and perhaps none of us would be here if, uh, if he had... Uh, uh, if he had failed. But it was a different world. It was a world of spheres of interest. So the whole point about uh, Russian missiles or proxy Russian missiles on Cuba, it's a completely different world uh, we, live in, uh, we live in now. And the spheres of influence are much more blurred uh, than they were there. There was a kind of a, you know, it was like the, 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 the idea was you'd have a, a, a nil-all draw, you know, with, with blitz skirmishes around the box every now and again, but, but no goals. And... Uh, so, uh, but no, I don't think I would use the word uh, word appeasement. Yeah, to, on the, in, in that context. Actually, that kind of again pivots to another question here, which is about arms control. And this kind of, we're in a new area in terms of nuclear agreements, essentially. Um, and maybe this is one for yourself, Tricia. Um, could the panellists go into more detail regarding arms control treaties like the INF? Who withdrew when and what order? How do we get them back to the table? That would be great. A little, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. informative session from yourself about wh what is the status of these agreements. Yeah, I can get very nerdy on this. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'll, I'll keep you in the in the lane. But yeah, a brief, you know, where peop, you know, what are what is the status of yeah, these? Yeah, where do these? we begin in this? Yeah. So I, I actually begin with the ABM treaty. Okay, so what? Uh, so this this was the anti ballistic missile treaty. Um, out of, uh, the U.S. pulled out of it in 2001. At the same time, that they were pulling away from the biological weapons uh, strengthening process. Um, and this was a major problem for Russia. Okay. And this set in train, I think, a whole set of uh, actions from Russia, which were in slow motion. So what happened was a few years later, people said, look, nothing happened as a result of pulling out of the ABM treaty. Like, Russia didn't do anything. But we're seeing that in part oh, sure. now. So these things, the dampening time of a system, I'm, I'm a physicist, sorry, is, is very important, right? These things take time. They take decades. Um, so um, what you had then was a pulling away from the, what's called the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. And that was already um, a treaty that had done its job, right? So all the weapons had been dismantled, got rid of, verified. There were still continuing inspections. So the sort of withdrawal from it wasn't like the end of the world except for the political signal. Does that mean they want to develop new intermediate range nuclear weapons? And the answer is yes. Okay. And now what we've seen, because of the uh, situation, we've had a, a withdrawal from the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. Again, it's a treaty which hasn't had a huge impact in, on the ground, as it were. It's been always in contention. But again, another political signal. That's Russia pulling out of it. Open skies. Russia and the United States pulled out. And I think that's really unfortunate. The rest of the European countries, the OSCE countries, um, remain committed to it, and the door's always open for them to come back. Um, and then now we're seeing the US pull out of the new START, which is START stands for Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Um, and this um, is, again, a big blow, because the strategic stability talks and the strategic bilateral relationship has remained through a very difficult period. And arms control, as opposed to disarmament and non-proliferation, but arms control has always been seen, seen as part of the strategic relationship between the United States and Russia. And to have that now in tatters... So the big blow, isn't it? The it's star, a huge the fall blow. Over the star it's treaty. a huge blow. Where now, the United now? States has been very clever. And I have to give a shout out to the United States because they, they've said, right, we're not going to the exchange information, right? We're not going to give you the information, but what we're going to do is publish it on the website. Oh, that's just brilliant. Okay, so they're saying well we're being done. transparent yeah. about their new... They're being completely transparent. So, so everyone will still get the information. <laughs> Russia will get the information. It's just they're not going to just do it through the, the old, old way through the treaty because Russia's mm -hmm. withdrawn. So I think that that's a really, really clever way. So there's smart ways to do this type of diplomacy, and I think we've just seen a, a, a yeah. killer blow from the United States on that. And of course we see, you know, the Iran nuclear deal has, is in the doldrums as well. well they, We're talking they, about the US a, opening back channels yeah, now to Iran, but the EU's role there in the JCPOA seems to be kind of... Yeah. I mean, we, everyone's sort of holding their breath for, you know, whether there'll be a change in administration in the US. In Iran, or... In, in well, the US. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and because the, this is, you know, a very party political issue. Yeah. The Trump Iran pulled issue. out of the Iran deal, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. yeah. um, we go to a few questions on the floor. Yeah, lady here. We'll take three questions maybe this time. Uh, t thanks to the panel. Councillor McNugent, um, Sinn Féin. Just on the implications uh, for Ireland, and I think, I think the vast majority of Irish people do support Ukraine. I think a lot of that is based on our own experience, historical experience of... I suppose occupation and oppression, but 
there would be some concern then that Russia's brutal war on Ukraine would give a pretext towards what I suppose our president called that drift towards um, NATO. So then perhaps then that's why it's important that we should enshrine neutrality in our constitution and ensure then that that's recognised and and that's recognised internationally as well. Our position of neutrality um, is is I suppose supported internationally, and then maybe a citizens assembly, which you know has been proposed in the dial, that could maybe be a forum to look what neutrality would mean and how that would be enshrined um, in our constitution, and it would be based on I suppose the state's proud record I suppose of peacekeeping and being that voice for international resolving um, conflicts. But then a mention was made as well about you know, the various organisations and some represented today on top table in terms of international uh, diplomacy and the whole question about that, you know, Putin doesn't listen and will he listen? But then you'd have to wonder and you look at the various, and it was, uh, it was mentioned there earlier about Israel and Palestine. Now how many resolutions on Palestine basically are ignored or are not enforced. Um, so where's, you could point then, where's the, the soft power, the strong power of the EU on that, which obviously contains a number of NATO countries. So maybe Putin will say, you know, look what's happened to people in Palestine and they're not being heard, or they're being heard, but there's no international um, compulsion on Israel there. So it doesn't really give a good example when trying to put soft power or hard power on Putin to listen. Um, and try and resolve uh, and deal with the brutal invasion of Ukraine. Mm. Thank Thanks. This is Lady here, yeah. Hi, Claire Cunningham, School of Public Health, and also from the World Federation of Public Health on Emergencies and Disasters. Um, so I was recently at the 76th World Health Assembly in Geneva, where health security was um, discussed um, in every context, and in particular in the context of um, the war in Ukraine, and um, both in the last session and in this session, health security hasn't been really addressed. And um, you know, nuclear war, it said, is the greatest um, global health threat that far exceeds any pandemic, any threat of pandemic, or any disease um, in the future. And um, you know, so I was just wondering what the panel um, thought about that, and you know. In relation to that, and in relation to the updating of the international health regulations. Okay, just the gentleman there in the middle, maybe. Is it, yeah. This man. Either there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you, yeah. Maybe the two of you. <laughs> if you keep it short. If you keep it short, yeah. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just one of the points uh, that I think might be worth making. Uh, First of all, uh, our definition of neutrality, it's not really there. I suppose the Hague Convention says something about it. Um, ours has variously been described as calculated ambiguity. A curry man called it something else, <laughs> cute, whatever. Um, but, but there is in the Constitution, and it might be no harm to remember this, um, a prohibition on joining an EU common defence, if I read the Constitution right. Um, so if the EU decide to have a common defence, we must go back to the people to engage in that. So in that context, that's the nearest you'll get to, a, to, 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 to neutrality. Uh, to neutral. The second point I want to make, and I'm not a supporter of joining NATO, let me make that clear at the outset. But, I, sorry, I was in the, in the military. I was a, an officer in Oglick and I, um, I served with Dutchmen. I served with Norwegians. I served with French. I served with Italians. I served with Danes, I served with Canadians, I served with British. So did Ned Horgan, certainly with the latter few. Um, so membership of NATO, I also served with Hungarians and Poles uh, when the Warsaw Pact was still in existence. The Poles may have been half in, half out at that stage, but the Hungarians certainly were. So even if we were to do that, it would not impact on our um, ability to, to uh, work with, uh, with, with, in, a, in, a U, in in UN in UN missions. Okay, great. And, and finally, you passed, just okay. on nuclear, the nuclear one. This yeah. is the last point yeah, I want to make. One. It just hasn't been mentioned, and it might be relevant as a bit of background, uh, since Ukraine has been mentioned. The Budapest Pact, uh, when the nuclear weapons were withdrawn from Ukraine, 
the, Russia guaranteed mm. the sovereignty yeah. of Ukraine, yes. and the UK and the US guaranteed to defend it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they're, that, that's something that hasn't been brought into this debate at all as a background to it, and I think it's Absol think it absolutely essential to right. And the Ukraine have made that point that they gave them up on those conditions. Yeah, and we, we're actually going to take five now yourself and then make <coughs> Right, and then um, Jerry White's my name, and another, another former member of the military. I just want to bring things closer to home. I think, you know, with a lot of talk about NATO, but I, we think we need to remind ourselves that six of the 32 counties in this island are already members of NATO. Right, that's very important. I think we should never lose sight of that. And my question to the panel in relation to that, do they think Northern Ireland's in, in the current challenging and changing security um, environment we're living in, do they think Northern Ireland's membership of NATO has a direct impact on our security at the moment? And equally, going forward, do they think Northern Ireland's membership of NATO should inform our security policies going forward. Okay, good question. Yeah. And finally, Mick Wallace for this round. <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, just to pick up on a couple of points uh, from the panel. Uh, first, Kate uh, from uh, OSCE. Uh, I'm uh, it's welcome to hear some sanity, and uh, uh, I appreciate uh, your words. Uh, you say that peace will come uh, eventually, and some sort of an arrangement will be made, and talks will happen sometime. But uh, why can't it happen now? Why, why, are, why are so many more people going to die in the meantime? Because there's only working class Ukrainians and working class Russians doing the dying. And the guys keeping the war going are wearing suits and they don't fight and they don't send their kids to fight. Only the poor fight in the wars. The, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that uh, the war so many people that would be considered uh, uh, rational uh, seem to be content with the war to continue. Now, uh, with the sanctions, Suzanne, you said, well, everybody back the sanctions. Well, in actual fact, 80% of the world won't back the sanctions. In the EU, I meant. Okay, like well, not, a, a lot of them were dragged to the table, too. Well, they, they, okay, they but made I mean, concessions. But the 80% yeah. the, the, the of the world that are not backing the sanctions is really significant that's, for the EU, right? That's true, yeah. Not only is, are the sanctions hurting the people of Europe, especially the less well-off, more than it's hurting the Russians, but you, we are isolating ourselves from 80% of the planet who want peace, who are not taking Russia's side, who are wanting peace, but they've been uh, vilified for wanting peace and not taking the US-NATO side in the war. I mean, uh, does the EU, does, does Ireland as part of the European Union realize that we're putting ourselves in the old camp, which is now the small camp, and it isn't the future camp? We're putting ourselves in a group of the old colonialists. And my, my last point, there's been so little mention of the US here, right? Uh, who, well, I was glad to hear has uh, been mentioned about the, the Americans first pulling out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2001, and they were the first to pull out the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty in 2019. Now, they obviously felt that they had the upper hand on the others at that stage, and they could ignore the treaties. Now, uh, at, a, at a CEDA committee there recently, uh, we had a panel of experts in talking about the nuclear threat in the war. And I put it to them that if, if, if NATO and the US and, and the EU go to a point of supporting Ukraine to a situation where they can actually try and take Crimea back, does, does this not risk a nuclear conflict with Russia? And he says, yeah, he says. But he says, uh, that's, that doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, support him to that point. We're actually prepared to risk Nuclear war? What's wrong with us? And listen, on China, right? You're, you're dynamizing China. China haven't dropped a bomb on anyone in 40 years. China warships are not in the Gulf of Mexico. US warships, they think they own the South China Sea. The US have, have been at war every year of its existence except 25 years. They dropped more bombs than every country in the world put together since 1945. They are a war nation. They thrive on it. And he won't call it out. I mean, there's, but China, listen, why are China being demonized? You say, oh, they're investing more now in defense and nuclear. Yeah, they are, yeah. One third of what the Americans are still doing today. Sorry. One third. I mean, uh, the, the anti-China rhetoric coming 
from the, the political class and the corporate media of, in the last couple of years is totally irrational and not in the interest of peace. It is madness. Okay, thanks. And final question now, sorry, to, in, in the interest of political balance, uh, Jerry Crockwell as well. Uh, and then we'll definitely stop there and have a discussion on these points. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. First, I want to thank the Tónaiste for putting this forum together. At least it means that the topic is now being discussed. The Ukrainian war, uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, put paddy neutrality out in front of us all. And I call it paddy neutrality because we're not really sure what we are. At the end of the day, our government decided to take sides in this war without coming to the Oireachtas to debate it. I agree with Gary, we cannot put neutrality in the Constitution. How would you even define it in the Constitution? The Department of Foreign Affairs defined neutrality for Ireland back in 1995, where they said neutrality meant you would not take the side of either belligerent in a conflict. Now, I don't care if it's medical equipment or petrol for ambulances. Once you started to give something to Ukraine, which I believe was totally justified, um, I, I think we so, uh, severed any connection we had with neutrality. Finally, to reply to my colleague from the European Parliament, if I take your back garden and by force and I decide I'm going to keep it, will you negotiate with me and allow me to keep a part of it? Come on. Ukraine is a sovereign state. They're entitled to, they're entitled, they're entitled to their own sovereignty. They're entitled to their own decisions. And those who want to support them are entitled to do that. But I do think it should have been debated in the Oireachtas before we before went. Okay, finally. Right, we're going back to the panel on those issues. <coughs> Lots of issues hit on there. One of them was neutrality. Does anyone want to come into the question about health security? Yeah, yeah. Like would you just like yeah. to... to, to deal with that? So I think this is really important and you really hit on something um, that, that is another space where we could push on this. I and mean, the World Health Organization has done a lot of work on, on violence as, as, a, as a major health issue. Uh, nuclear weapons, again, you're right, not great for health and I put them up there with climate change. And, and, um, and, and the Red Cross and the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War have all put health into that space and I think it's a really good place to put humans at the centre of our security thinking. So thank you for that. Um, Can I just, um, yes, go on. Well, there's a lot going on, obviously, yes, yes. but uh, just, just, just two yeah, points, uh, perhaps. One on the McNugent's point. I mean, I don't think there's anyone saying, uh, the Tonish maybe can correct me here, uh, but that this, this four will then be the end of the discussion. And maybe perhaps there should be uh, a Citizens' Assembly, because Citizens' Assembly, as we know, uh, have worked. And, and to one of Mick Wallace's many points, if President Putin withdrew his troops to where they were on the 23rd of February uh, 2022, there would be the war would end. That's true. Mm. You want to come in there, Kate? Can you be on the main? A number of, yeah? Yeah. Um, just in case. Yeah. Okay, Kate, you want to come in there? Yeah. Okay, Kate. Yeah, thanks, um, Suzanne. Yeah, I think there are so many interesting points, but maybe if I could um, touch on a couple of them, um, just uh, we're yeah. rounding up. Go ahead. Um, so, I mean, as well as just harkening back to what Patricia said about the, you know, we have the strategic level um, treaties um, to deal with, like the the, the big big guns. Um, but one of the things that OSC is dealing with is the proliferation of small arms and light weapons that we have seen um, across Europe and in relation to the war against Ukraine. And so those weapons weapons are um, not being regulated at the moment and um, will be used um, a, to assist and enable uh, criminal groups and, and criminal acts. So these kind of, we, we need to be addressing on all of the levels um, the proliferation of weapons, be they very large or, or be them small. Um, and so this, uh, this is certainly um, a, a, a core part of uh, OSC's work. Um, and in terms of why aren't there peace talks tomorrow? I mean, we, we all want that. Nobody here is content to have this war go on for another day. Yes, um, there's many people have, have, have died, and regrettably, I think it's, 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 a, it's a reality that, that, that more people will die, and we, we won't want this war to, to stop. It, it should stop. Um, and we do all we can to try and bring about the conditions where people do come to the uh, negotiating table, including maintaining a platform for dialogue in, this, in the heart of Europe, in the hope that people will, will, will use it. 
And um, I think on the issue of health security, it absolutely chimes with where the OSC's comprehensive approach to security. So I mentioned a number of things earlier, Paul Mill, um, economic and environmental and human security. Um, I think this is an area that we are moving more and more uh, into, um, but it's, it, it, it's, it's real. And maybe to give an example of not health per se, but how um, different elements, um, the interface of different elements combine to, to create security. So for example, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have an environmental policy which crosses two municipalities. Uh, one is um, majority ethnic Bosniak, the other is majority uh, ethnic uh, uh, Croat. Um, and using the idea of, well, if we join together our resources and we create a better place for tourists to come that creates better economic uh, empowerment, uh, economic conditions, um, economic empowerment, including for women, rural women, um, and that in itself helps to prevent further conflict. So getting uh, frameworks to build relationships between communities. So that's part of the work of, of what we're about. And we see very clearly that health comes in. And if I could just briefly, yeah. maybe taking off my OSC hat for a moment and address the question of Northern Ireland. Because, yeah, I was, um, this I, is one of the very interesting points about yeah. Northern Ireland and, and its membership in NATO, in fact. Yeah. Well, I was actually thinking about this um, uh, more broadly coming to uh, the, the, the forum today. And I was actually thinking about it from the other side of the border, if you will, and that is if we are getting into a ground where we might be really discussing a, a renewed Ireland, a new Ireland, a, an all of Ireland polity, um, uh, which the Brexit discussion has put back on the table for us, which, which was um, settled by the Good Friday Agreement to all extents and purposes, but now is, is a debate, obviously, again. Um, where does um, the Northern Irish experience of having been in a NATO country, how is that integrated? I mean, we talk about, uh, let's say, in New Ireland uh, at some stage in the future, we will need to be talking about integrated education, integrated economies. A lot of that is, is largely done, the, the healthcare system as well. But these issues of um, foreign policy, um, of foreign policy alignment um, and defence. Those are yeah. very much, uh, yeah, part it's of it. So I think it's a really interesting uh, question to it, raise. It's a very good point. And then just to pick up kind of generally maybe on Mick, some of Mick Wallace's points there, and um, just to clarify, the 27 EU member states did back sanctions, but you're absolutely right that n lots of other countries in the world have not sanctioned Russia, and even ones closer to, you know, closer to home, Serbia, for example, Turkey, for example, have not, ba you know, gone with the, the, the sanctions package that the EU adopted. Um, but there is this other theme, which I suppose is a question for Ireland in terms of its EU membership, its European membership, and its broader global role. And that is the whole issue of other countries in the global south. I'm using that fra phrase in inverted commas, it's, it's crept in now. To, and, and some people would say that in the UN, for example, it's a forum to maybe talk to these countries who um, are not, some people say, are not prepared, you know, who are not backing the, the EU standard to discuss this issue with them. And do you think we're all a bit, you know, Eurocentric in our views there? Or does anyone have any views? Although, after all, it is a war that's happening on the European continent. Anyone want to come in on that? Or the China, the fact, are we demonising China too much? Anyone? <laughs> No. I, mean, I, I might come, come, come back on, 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 on China. I, I, I don't think that you know, people in general are demonizing China. If, if you look at, at China, it's a, it's a country I, I, I followed. The, the, the situation internally has become significantly more repressive over the last decade or so. If you look at, you know, take the Taiwan issue, what's been the single biggest escalatory step across the Taiwan Straits over the last decade has been the creeping up, the creeping up, the creeping up of Chinese military, military exercises, Chinese military build-up around, 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 around Taiwan. So yes... China. Mm. China, but that is the case. This is <laughs> we, the problem. We, well, yeah. well, and, and again, I, I would raise a, 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 an, an, issue, an issue of democracy. The people of Taiwan yeah. do not want to be integrated into the Communist People's Republic of China. Ma yeah. But, but it is a, a... Yeah, but it, uh, 
Where where is the consensus? No, no, where is the consensus? When is it? Consensus coming generally speaking about China and Russia, etc. And I can go along with a hell of a lot of it. But the Chinese one is, is, is stunning. Countries, people, business, do business and relation to rural people. The Americans currently are in a hell of a situation with the Chinese. And it puts all of us. Well, the U.S. policy is very strongly uh, under Trump and Biden. Seen China, they've come out and said that as a. As a the actual, I mean, we're talking about. Anyway, we're probably di digressing here a bit, so we might. Patricia, thank you. Nick just opened it. Put Mark Schiff came back with flag that the Americans were the first to walk away from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. ABM. Okay. Right. Secondly, the academic that flagged the issue with the nuclear weapons in Oddball in Russia was actually responding another American academic, by the way you see a trend of academics, an American academic, Rubin, who published a paper okay. actually indicating that strategic limit to nuclear weapons should be given to Ukraine immediately. Okay. okay, we'll just move on to the next round now. We have somebody no, we're not all bad. Here. <laughs> we're nearly coming to an end. So a couple more questions and we'll finish up. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Alessia Zhitkova. I'm uh, originally Ukrainian and I came here fleeing from Russian war against uh, Ukraine uh, last year. And also I work uh, in DCU as a postdoctoral researcher and I'm a representative of uh, Ukrainian community here in Cork. And first of all, many thanks to Irish state and Irish people for uh, such a huge support. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, we uh, we are really um, appreciate it, uh, and um, I'd like to emphasize that um, uh, supporting basic human rights is not breaking a, a neutrality at all. Uh, I, I assume it is. Uh, it should be um, so. Uh, People should, should, should not be afraid uh, to support not only Ukrainians, but uh, all uh, whose rights um, are, um, uh, are vulnerable and uh, all whose rights uh, are uh, in danger because of uh, an aggressor. Regarding to Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians, uh, the aggressor is uh, Russia. Uh, so, and um, when uh, we were sitting here uh, in the morning, uh, the, the news um, came from Ukraine uh, that Ukraine, Ukrainian intelligence uh, claims that uh, Russia, uh, Russian uh, army, uh, is ready is ready to uh, uh, to uh, I don't know to. Uh, blow up or something like this, the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. So, uh, as you can see, there is uh, no problems for Russia to, uh, to, to, to cause the damage to Europe just because they think they can do it. Uh, and uh, no, no weapons or uh, giving weapon, weapons to Ukraine or not giving weapons to Ukraine, uh, it would help. Because uh, as uh, it was said that Russia is a, a, an aggressor and uh, they uh, cannot uh, afford the, to let Ukraine from their mental Soviet Union in, in which they want to continue to live. And so the question is, um, do Irish people are aware enough uh, of nuclear uh, threat, uh, of Russian nuclear threat to Ukraine, which can damage all the Europe? As and we know that, uh, in case of uh, Chernobyl uh, explosion, uh, Ireland was uh, uh, damaged uh, and threatened. Yeah. To yeah. Thanks very much. And final question there. Before we go to the panel. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. It's Judy Peddle uh, Pana, a Peace and Neutrality Alliance. Uh, just a couple of points. It's actually related to what Mick was saying, um, that uh, the uh, southern, so, the global south, for want of a better term, uh, there's uh, been. A, I read an analysis from uh, an American French journalist based in America about their stance, or uh, that, and most of them um, are, are totally, you know, 
was the young man uh, saying there, what country's wrong? They, they, most of them do think Putin and Russia are totally wrong, apart maybe from Syria and a couple of others. But they haven't sort of backed the West with sanctions. And they're keeping normal, um, uh, pretty much more diplomatic relations with Russia and everything. And uh, um, Alain Gabon said there were kind of three reasons. Once, uh, one was the double standards and hypocrisy of the West, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, very large people there, a lot of these people were directly affected by it. Two, they outrage at the racist difference in attitudes towards the refugees. You know, if they're not white and they're European, they, you, the West don't seem to care a damn about them. And uh, also other conflicts like the Yemen and Ethiopia, which have been horrendous as well, and the West don't seem to care about that. And uh, the th that ties into the third point. They think that the West, to, for the West to react so strongly to this particular war, they have some class and an agenda, which understandably the, these countries are very suspicious of. And that, that's another thing for the reservations. And just one last point is that um, Ireland has tends to have a, a, a more greater affinity with these countries than um, uh, also as well as the uh, developing ones in India, India and um, South Africa as well. Um, a greater affinity, uh, having been colonised with these countries, and for d the last few decades, not uh, to do with Ukraine, not, ne not necessarily to do with Ukraine, they have expressed dismay at the way Irish, Irish neutrality has been diluted. Okay, that's it. Okay, thanks. That'll be the final one. Can we just, uh, maybe you come in, yes, on the nuclear plant. I mean, people are reading these new headlines yeah. this morning yeah, well. about this nuclear plant in Ukraine. You know, very good question there. I mean, how do you assess things? Is this a real concern? Real concern. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. It was on my list and I didn't get around to it. So um, what, what's been happening in Zaporizhia is uh, we've been very worried about the uh, removal of the power supply. So um, all the reactors, all six reactors in shutdown, I think five of them cold shut, what's called cold shutdown, one in what's called hot shutdown. So they're, they're not operational in the way that uh, normally they would be producing electricity. So that's a good thing. But they do require constant cooling. And for that, they need water. Um, and they have a reservoir. And there is enough in the reservoir, despite the blowing up of the dam at the moment, to keep that cool. Um, uh, the power supply, though, there is just one external power supply. Um, and so if that gets blown up, then the pumps uh, will not work. So you have to then go into the backup um, internal power supplies, which is, is a real problem because they only have a, a limited life. So some real worries. And as you rightly say, the IAEA reported some weeks ago uh, that there were reports of uh, Russian military moving explosives, ammunition, weapons into the turbine halls, into the buildings of the Zaporizhia um, power plant. So they're using it, it seems, as a, another nuclear threat, a different type of nuclear threat. By the way, a nuclear power explosion of any type is nowhere near as bad as a single nuclear bomb. Just, just be very yeah. aware. The huge discrepancy. Yes. So, but we are still talking about a potential environmental disaster, local, and as you rightly say, possibly then spreading to other European countries in the way that we've seen um, in, with other reactor uh, problems. It wouldn't be like Chernobyl. It's a different type of reactor. It's more like Fukushima, the style of reactor. So, you know, we, we shouldn't go back to our terrible memories of Chernobyl. But the, uh, the, the Fukushima reactor has had a huge impact on, on the region um, in, in Japan. Um, and uh, so the, the, the idea that you would put a whole load of explosives into a large nuclear power station, the largest nuclear power station uh, in Ukraine, and, and, um, and, and do that, is, it beggars belief. It's extraordinarily irresponsible and clearly designed uh, to stop um, anyone from uh, getting to those uh, weapons in, in a defensive way. Thanks so. for that thought. Any final thoughts by the panel? You don't, any, anybody want to come in and think? I think we we'll leave, we'll leave it at that. And thanks for that kind of um, chilling reminder of some of the realities that are happening at the moment. Thanks everyone for your attention, both here in the room and for those of you uh, tuning in online. Um, before you rush off, some, some instructions. So we're breaking for lunch now. Um, and our next speakers for session three after lunch will be Richard Brown, Robert McArdle, Chris Johnson, Richard Parker, Brigadier General Sean White and David Giles. So those speakers don't go anywhere. You have to uh, mic up at 1.30 uh, in the green room. And for everyone else, if you're at your seats just before at 2 p.m. Uh, for the afternoon session. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you.